There we are. Um, so uh, we are now on to our third panel, um, which is entitled Cyberspaces, the Challenges, Accessibility and Audiences of Digitized Places. Um, and it is chaired by Dr. Dara Gannon, who I said at the beginning, I am very grateful um, for in helping uh, me organizing this uh, symposium. Um, when I first had the idea, um, I spoke to Peter and he referred me to Dara to talk through some ideas um, as he had a bit of experience from his Global Archives project, which he will probably share a little bit about um, once all um, participants have uh, shared their papers with us. Um, so we have um, four papers uh, in this panel, um, uh, Jonathan Small's, uh, Jonathan Small and uh, Rob Barrett's um, paper um, was shown earlier on in the symposium. So if you're watching the second video uh, and looking for it, it's in the first video um, and that will be replaced by um, Hannah McAuliffe, who um, was scheduled to present in our first panel. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to um, Dara. Um, to chair this panel. If you have any questions, um, please uh, raise your virtual hand or type your question in the chat box. I think our first um, participant to present is uh, Rebecca um, Mulligan, uh, sorry, Rebecca Milligan um, from uh, Queens uh, on mapping World War II airfields. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just beginning um, for us, Rebecca, if that's okay. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Uh, Thank I, you. <laughs> uh, I'll just share my screen. Right, hopefully you can all see my slide there. Um, so hello, uh, my name is Rebecca Mulligan and I'm currently a postgraduate researcher uh, at Queen's University of Belfast. My research focuses on what happens to World War II aviation sites after they've been abandoned and tracing the afterlife of the site through to the present day. Uh, much of the work involves the use of Geographic Information Systems or GIS to digitally map and trace features within the evolving landscape. However, while digital mapping can capture spatial data relating to the physical aspects of the site, uh, there are concerns about its ability to incorporate non-spatial data. Uh, over the course of the past two decades, digital mapping has become increasingly prevalent. Digital maps have made it easier to compare different maps and encourage spatial debates about maps within maps. Digital maps also encourage user participation, allowing users to manipulate the data within the maps and choose how this data is viewed. The success of digital mapping has been enabled due to the development of GIS. A GIS is software which specialises in handling geographically referenced data. The aim of GIS is to digitally view and analyse maps. However, scholars such as Bodenhammer have criticised GIS for attempting to explore the physical world using a systematic approach based on the assumption that space is impartial. A GIS is capable of storing and processing vast amounts of data in geographical context, and it enables researchers flexibility in how to organise, display and analyse this data. For example, while a flat image such as a map or aerial imagery may be added to a GIS, other layers may then be created to break down the information contained within the image, such as the road network or field system. Specific information about each feature may then be attached and stored uh, in a table linked geographically to each feature. This tabular data may then be used to explore trends or visualise particular aspects of the data. However, the information needs to fit within a table uh, and qualitative data can be difficult to express. GIS is fundamentally designed to handle exact and quantifiable data rather than vague or incomplete sources. For this reason, GIS is often criticised within humanities scholarship, which often deals with uncertainty. 
Due to the difficulties of including qualitative data within a GIS, there can be an over tendency to rely on quantifiable information, which can skew our view and understanding of the world. However, GIS allows scholars to better understand how changes occur in different places. Scholars such as Stickelbaugh have used GIS to show change over time by layering aerial imagery and maps from different time periods. GIS also enables a contextual view showing how places and features are spatially linked. GIS can aid in the recreation of historical landscapes from which scholars can gain a better understanding of why a particular decisions may have been made. For example, by adding topographic uh, map of Gettysburg, which was drawn shortly after the Civil War, researchers were able to determine what Robert E. Lee could and could not see from his vantage point. In recent years, there has been a move to push GIS beyond its current boundaries and find alternative ways of incorporating qualitative data within a system primarily designed for quantitative data. My own research focuses on World War II airfields in Northern Ireland and uses GIS to trace how these landscapes have changed over time. Since partition 1922, tensions have existed in Northern Ireland between the nationalist and unionist communities. Initially, these tensions caused grave concerns to the British military, who worried that should any military installations be constructed in Northern Ireland, they would be targeted by nationalist groups. However, Northern Ireland was the furthest part of the UK from the front lines in Europe, making it an ideal training location. Its Atlantic seaboard location meant it was vital in maintaining trade and communication routes with America and the rest of the world. As the war effort intensified, the internal situation within Northern Ireland was deemed to have calmed sufficiently to allow for a military presence, leading to a massive building scheme. Using GIS, it is possible to explore historic and modern data relating to the airfield at different scales. From all of Northern Ireland and how the sites related to each other, to a local scale exploring the unique landscape of individual sites. Different layers from the GIS may be used to not only capture the different scales, but also different time periods. By mapping features created in historic aerial imagery and RAF site plans, we can map how the area would have appeared throughout the decades, noting changes and highlighting features that are gone and those that remain. Much of this work is limited by the existence and accessibility of historic aerial imagery and, and site plans. Even when these sources do exist, they may not always be complete or in good condition. However, they offer glimpses into the past that can be pieced together within the GIS to give a real sense of how landscape has changed and how it would have been when the airfield was in operation. Take, for example, RAF Bally Kelly, one of the longest operational military airfields in Northern Ireland. Bally Kelly is located on the north coast and continued to be used as a military base until 2008. It is unique among airfields in Northern Ireland, both due to its continued military presence, which was rivalled only by Aldergrove, and the fact it is currently in the process of being demilitarised and redeveloped. The village of Ballycally has grown around the airfield and as such has a unique relationship with it. The main entrance to the airfield is down a normal looking residential street, and a number of private properties run up to the perimeter fence. The spite was split into two areas. The top camp contained all the residential and office buildings, as well as a shop and gym. As you can see in the picture on the left, there is a very crowded, uh, a very crowded built up area. A tarmacadden roadway connected top camp um, with the runways, which were in an area known as, <coughs> sorry, which were in an area known as bottom camp. Conversely, bottom camp is a vast and relatively empty area. Uh, this area was further away from the village, but a railway line runs along the northern perimeter of the area. One of the runways needed to be extended during the war, but this meant it crossed over the Derry to Belfast railway line, as you can see in the image of the right, uh, giving the train passengers a unique view of the airfield. Using existing uh, archaeological methods of digital site survey uh, through the analysis of aerial imagery and maps, the airfield, such as the one at Bally Kelly, can be mapped within, within the GIS. By mapping these sites in this way, we can see how the modern landscape has developed. In the case of Bally Kelly, the landscape has been heavily modified by the, since the fourth edition OS map was surveyed and drawn in the years before World War II. The RAF site plan for the airfield at Bally Kelly is a reproduction rather than the original and does not contain information on each individual building as would have been included on the original map. 
However, it does show us where boundaries of the various sites were intended to be during World War II and the position of the runways. Aerial imagery was taken of the site during World War II and can be used to explore how the site was modified uh, during World War II beyond what was detailed in the original plan. Unfortunately, the aerial imagery does not always capture the whole area. Most of the older aerial imagery only captures the runways and even then not necessarily the whole runway, uh, but it is still possible to trace when certain features were added or modified. When the historic sources are compared to modern aerial imagery, the runways are still clearly visible to this day, as well as many of the hard standings and perimeter track. Furthermore, we can see an increase in the civilian population, possibly as a direct consequence of the airfield itself, creating job opportunities and improving the land through drainage. While this provides us with an understanding of how the physical landscape has evolved, it lacks a human element. It does not give us a sense of how people who inhabited and are currently inhabiting the landscape perceive this landscape and its history. In Northern Ireland, the modern understanding of the airfields can have a big impact on how it is viewed today. But this understanding is not necessarily the same as the facts and truths detailed in history books. These are based on perceptions, uh, or these perceptions are based on stories told by local populations. Sometimes these stories are half remembered and embellished, and sometimes they are a patchwork of many different stories from different places. Regardless of the actual truth and historical veracity of these stories, they are real to the people who are living there now and colour their understanding of these places. Mapping this kind of information is very hard, not least because these places uh, referenced in these stories are usually quite general and everyone has their own valid version of events. In practice, attempts to explore the full history of a site potentially creates a prose-based cultural map which sits alongside a GIS-based map of the physical landscape. It is therefore important to ensure that the qualitative data is embedded within the GIS alongside any quantitative data. One of the biggest obstacles to this is that a traditional GIS was not designed to handle such data. The qualitative data needs to be presented within a tabular format and be tied to a physical location in order to appear on the GIS. In the past, this was particularly challenging due to the 255 character limit for data entered into a GIS. However, this cap has been lifted in newer GIS systems such as ArcGIS Pro. By allowing more characters, it is now possible to add several paragraphs of text to a single point. This in turn allows unmappable data to be added to the GIS and appear when a, a user clicks on a point. For Bally Kelly, people, comments and memories have been added to the map in this way. A symbology has also been assigned to alert users to the presence of these elements in the landscape. However, there's still an issue with where to place such elements. Many of the memories and comments either do not refer to an exact place or the place that has been mentioned cannot be found in the map such as colloquial names for places or the common practice in using people's homes as a form of giving direction. The decision was made to include these elements by placing the point in the general vicinity that the data likely refers to. While this has the potential to mislead users into thinking the points refer to the exact location where an accounted event occurred, it allows the landscape to become populated with the comments and memories that would otherwise be lost. These layers can be combined with mappable elements such as the aerial imagery and site plans to provide a more rounded uh, view and understanding of the modern landscape. This creates a landscape that users may explore beyond the remit of cultural narrative. Furthermore, unlike a narrative, it doesn't present the data to the user in any particular order. Instead, it is up to the user to search the landscape for areas of interest to them, similar to the use of traditional paper map. At Ballykelly, we can see a close connection with the surrounding population. The airfield at Ballykelly was not built in isolation, but among a vibrant community. The military remained in the area for a long time, but that time has now passed. The area is currently undergoing many changes as the population attempts to move beyond its military use. A common thread seen in many of the stories told about the military is the soldiers' willingness to travel further outside of the area than the local population. The coming of the military appears to have transported this small rural population into the middle of a lively and cosmopolitan community and creating international connections. Its long operational history has meant that the airfield at Bally Kelly is a big part of the landscape. You can see in the image of the left, on the left just how much the scale of the airfield dwarfs the village. 
However, as uh, particularly the top camp is so closely linked with the village, there is a drive among the local population to demilitarise the area. Prior to going on sale, the gate and surrounding fence were placed to provide a softer image for locals to look at. There was hope the existing buildings in top camp could be reused as housing, but when surveyed, it was decided that they were no longer suitable. As a result, much of the top camp is in the process of being demolished. A reed bed is planned for an area in bottom camp. It is hoped that one day people will be able to use this land for recreational purposes, such as horse riding on walks. The fate of the rest of the airfield is still up for debate, but it is unlikely that the runways will ever be removed. Uh, as for commemoration, a memorial garden was created in Bottom Camp while it was in use, while the site was in use. However, the military have a policy of not looking back. Once they leave a site, they no longer hold any significance with the site. As such, they chose to move the memorial to a nearby church when the site closed in 2008. At Bally Kelly, there is an active attempt to demilitarise the area and move forward into a new chapter, but time will tell if this is possible as the use of the site are still constrained by the presence of the concrete runways. There are concept, these are concepts and stories that are not easily mapped, but they are vital to our current and future understanding of this landscape and its history. It is therefore incumbent on us to find new and creative ways of incorporating it within digital maps alongside the physical landscape. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Rebecca, um, for a really wonderful paper on really giving a sense of the scope, but also the limitations of digital mapping as it related to um, the Valley Kelly airfield. Um, and again, apologies, I think for some reason my introduction earlier um, wasn't working, so uh, I was delighted to hear your pre presentation, and I'm sure there'll be questions at the end of the um, panel. But now we move on to our second speaker of this session, and that is Chris Hamill of the School of Architecture at Queen's University, Belfast, and his paper is entitled The Atlas of Lost Rooms. Chris. Thanks very much, Dara. Um, let me just get this sharing. And do -do -do. Right. Uh, is that showing OK? Perfect. Yes. Excellent. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for tuning in. My name is Chris Hamill. Uh, I'm an architect and I'm currently a PhD candidate in the School of Architecture at Queen's. Um, and my presentation today is um, an exploration, a sort of a walkthrough uh, of a recent pilot project that I did uh, for my ongoing PhD research. Um, which is looking at digitising and creating digital repositories of um, of Ireland's Magdalen history and the history of Ireland's Magdalen laundries. Um, so I I must uh, at the start both express um, my um, my appreciation and an absolutely stellar presentation earlier by Connor Murphy and also a, a great deal of thanks because um, you've gone into the context of the background of this uh, in much more detail than I would have time in in this presentation. So thank you for for providing that context um, and. Um, really really insightful as well uh, i'm just going to drop in the chat the link to the project website um while i'm speaking if you guys want to have a, a pot around the, the web interface um absolutely feel free uh, and i'll we'll maybe come back to that at the end depending on how we're faring for time um but please do check out the website and and uh, be really interesting to hear your thoughts uh, either in a private message or at the end of the session um so what the Atlas of Lost Rooms is effectively, it's a digital reconstruction of the last uh, Magdalen Laundry in the Republic of Ireland uh, to close that on Sean McDermott Street in Dublin. Um, and what we did was we we rebuilt the site uh, using digital 3D architectural modelling and then overlaid it with um, survivor testimony in order to create a sort of specialised repository of, of the voices of the Magdalen women. Um, in in this, we were uh, greatly benefited um, by the support of colleagues at the Open Heart City, who are a group of academics and activists, um, particularly concerned with the Sean McDermott Street site. For those of you who are not familiar with the site, um, it's currently the only Magdalen site in state ownership and, and therefore is a, is a focus for what to do with this particular sort of um, particularly difficult and dark heritage site. 
and, and all the, the questions that raises about the memorialization of Ireland's Magdalen history. In terms of the financing of, of how to get the website set up and, and paying for the modelling and stuff like that, we were very um, fortunate and grateful to receive uh, cluster funding from Queen's University. Uh, and we also benefited from um, uh, an interchange between Queen's and the University uh, University College Dublin's architecture schools, who were both looking at the site for their master's programme last year, and that's sort of where this stemmed out from. Um, so just to um, quickly go through, I'll, I'll be quite site specific on this. As I said, my thanks to um, to Connor for the the general background of of um, Ireland's Magdalen laundries, and, and that allows me, I think, to be a bit more site specific here. So um, the site in question, the Sean McDermott Street Magdalen laundry, uh, was built on what was at the time called Gloucester Street uh, in the 1820s. There's reference um, in papers dating to that time of of an asylum or a refuge for uh, homeless women and prostitutes um, built on the site, uh, run by by lay people. But in the 1870s, uh, the site was taken over by the religious order, the Sisters of Mercy, who ran it until the late 1880s, um, and at which point it was taken over by the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity of the Refuge, a French religious order who had set up um, several convents and Magdalen laundries in Ireland, including Sean McDermott Street and also the large site in Drumcondra, which was known as High Park. Um, at the time, uh, as was discussed earlier, the Magdalen Laundry was not a uniquely Irish phenomenon. It never has been um, and was, at least its stated purpose, was for the um, the care and the rehabilitation of prostitutes and other fallen women. It was in post-independence Ireland that uh, the Laundries took on a particularly carceral and punitive role, um, although they still um, operated under the assumption, at least in the public um, the public perception that these were, were refuges for prostitutes that less and less ceased to be the case into the point in into the post 1920s era where there were very few prostitutes actually accepted in the laundries and the religious sisters would not accept uh, former prostitutes instead incarceration in a laundry uh, would often be the result of giving birth out of wedlock um, or um, becoming a victim of, of sexual abuse or sexual violence but girls and women could also be incarcerated in a Magdalen laundry uh, for other so-called offences or, or perceived offences uh, such as um, learning difficulties or being seen as too pretty and therefore likely to fall and effectively what the laundries became was a sort of a a collection, uh, a way of the state uh, and with the, 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 the church and, and the consent of the state, um, sort of hiding away those people who were deemed to fall short of the moral standards required in the new Irish Catholic uh, proto-nation that was forming at the time. It was a way of sort of concealing those who did not conform. Um, this is one of very few photos exist of the interior of the Magdalene Laundries in operation. Uh, this is one of the um, one of the, the few that we, we find is a postcard that the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity produced in the 1920s as a way of raising funds um, to show the good work that they were doing for these fallen women. Um, and I think this photo is really poignant because it is populated in, in a way that so few uh, Magdalene resources are. You actually see the women here and, and, and it humanises it to a great degree, at least for me. Uh, especially as an architect, I'm usually more interested in, in sort of spaces and buildings, but you actually, when you see places popular like this, it really does hammer home the human aspect of this, which has to be at the forefront of any research into these sites. And indeed, in, in the pilot project we were looking at, the, the voices of the Magdalene laundries we, we intended, and we were consciously and, and I hope scrupulously uh, taking steps to ensure that they were front and uh, foremost. Um, you heard Connor earlier mention the Magdalene Oral Histories project in 2013. Um, of those 80 or so records, we have five um, women who spent time in the Sean McDermott Street Laundry, predominantly in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Lucy, Martina Keogh, Mary, Mary May and Sarah Albert. Martina Keogh uh, chose to use a pseudonym in the recordings. Uh, but they speak for hundreds, if not thousands of women who trans transited through the site in the hundreds of years of its operation or the hundred and so years of its operation. It had a capacity for about 150 women at any given time. And while the records are spotty, uh, we have records pretty, um, we have pretty solid records between 1950 or 22 and 52, and we know at that point that the numbers in any given point didn't fall be below 120 residents at any given time. So it's fair assumption that there were in the thousands of women who passed through this site. Sean McDermott Street site, as I said, was the last Megalon laundry in Ireland to close. It closed in 1996. 
which is horrifyingly recent. In fact, it's probably within the lifespan of most people in this call. I, I think, again, it really hammers on the point that this is not ancient history. Uh, after it closed, the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity sold it to the Dublin City Corporation, who tried to drum up investment and redevelop the site, uh, ultimately failing. And then in 2006, um, a large part of the site caught fire and was damaged and subsequently demolished. Um, this is what the site looks like today. Parts of it still survive. Um, and it was in 2017, it was revealed that a Japanese uh, budget hotel chain had been given preferential bidder status to redevelop the site into a budget hotel. Uh, that, as you can imagine, met with quite um, substantial public backlash about how grossly insensitive it was. Uh, that's now been pulled and there are ongoing discussions about what to do with the site and how to commemorate and memorialize the site. As I said, it is the last of the Magdalens in state ownership. Um, so on to the, the project itself then, um, and as I said, if you sort of in the background checking out the website, this will um, hopefully um, add a little bit of context to what I'm talking about. But we had three main objectives in, in taking this forward. So the first, uh, and in some ways the most straightforward, was a digital reconstruction of the site as it would have existed prior to the fire in 2006. Um, it would be useful to reconstruct the site as a, as a tool for architectural understanding of how the site developed and how the site once looked at the parts that are lost, um, but also um, as a way of understanding how the architecture participated in or bore witness to the abuses suffered. Um, this is not a sterile exercise in architectural history. This is fundamentally based in the voices and, and the experiences of the women who toiled in these places over many years. But secondarily and, and tertiarily to that, we had um, the goal of preservation uh, not only to preserve a facsimile of the architecture of the site itself, but also to preserve the memory of the women who who laboured in Sean McDermott Street and specifically the place memory. Um, that while we had the excellent work and, and we used it very gratefully from the Oral History Project in 2013, um, it was not spatialised. It, it, it was testimony that was written in textual form, freely accessible on the web, and I would encourage anyone who's interested to check it out. Um, but it's not loc geolocated. It's, there's no spatial uh, data or spatial organisation to the testimony, nor should there be expected to be. Um, but place and memory are so closely interlinked um, that it, it seemed to us imperative to try to, to knit those two things together and to preserve the the places where the memories happened. I think that was a really critical um, part of, of the, the um, preservation of these memories. It wasn't just about the text of the event or the recounting of the event. It was also an, an ability to illustrate the places in which these events took place. Uh, and then also to create a, a, a venue for reflection. It's been noted um, in, by scholars Jaeger and Colleton, um, amongst others, that there is a real um, lack of public engagement, relatively speaking, with Irish Magdalen history, especially in comparison to the abuses committed uh, in uh, orphanages or the industrial schools, for example. And so the aim was to make these testimonies tangible and accessible uh, to the public at large and try to, to encourage that, that public engagement. The name itself, uh, the Atlas of Lost Rooms, is a, is a curious one. It's maybe a little bit of a, a sort of an architectural flourish, um, but it grew out the, the, so it's in two parts. It's worth just chatting about that briefly. The, the name Atlas um, stems back from when we were initially talking about this. It was actually via paper publication. It was COVID that brought it online and I think to the project's benefit. But in terms of why we called it an atlas, I, I think it's instructive to consider the, the old road atlas that you used to get um, when you were going on a, a family holiday before Google Maps was on everything. Um, an atlas is is a way of um, of organising spatial data. Um, so it's a spatial organisation. You know, you you have the big contents page, which is maybe your map of Ireland, and you have lots of little rectangles that say, if you want to look at the northwest, go to page ninety two, southeast, go to page one hundred and three. In, in a very similar way, uh, the the atlas, an atlas is at its core a way of spatially organising information, usually maps, but not necessarily at a range of different scales. And I think that was really important in discussing the architecture of this site, uh, that this didn't operate just at the level of a building or a room or a piece of laundry equipment. It also operated, there's a scale above that where the, we have sort of the whole in, inter-institutional network. Um, and the Magdalen Laundries were not um, isolated institutions. They, they relied on a, a network which played out at the scale of the entire nation. And in and uh, beyond that, as we discussed earlier, there's also an international element to this as well. Uh, and the Lost Rooms simply refers to the fact that while the site is um, rough, it's still relatively well preserved. Uh, as Magdalen sites go, it is still um, much of the site has been demolished. So everything that's coloured in, in um, bluey green here on the screen was demolished subsequent to the 2006 fire. So the fire itself took place around here. A relatively small fire, actually, 
uh, and one that was pretty quickly contained by the fire service. This is a site in central Dublin, and it's, it's pretty accessible, uh, but resulted in the demolition of large parts of this site. Um, and I'm not implying any sinister motives to that or any intention to conceal. It may just be that the fact that the parts that were either fire damaged or were demolished subsequently were the cheapest parts of the site that were built quickly uh, and less robustly than some of the rest, and therefore they, they degraded more over time, so it wasn't worth preserving them or attempting to preserve them uh, for a purely economic reason. Um, but of course, because they were the parts of the site that had less um, TLC poured into them, they were necessarily the parts of the site that were associated with the women. They were the laundry buildings, the industrial parts of the site, the bits where these women laboured. Um, we still luckily have the dormitory block, this projection here, which still stands at the back of the site, um, but it's in really parlous state. And actually many, um, many uh, proposals have said that this is not salvageable. Um, and uh, will need to be demolished. Uh, we hope that we, I, I hope personally that that is able to be preserved because it's the last link on the site to the, the places where the women labored, the rest of the site is related to the convent where the nuns lived or, or the church. Um, so I think that that last physical link to the women's stories is really important to preserve. And, and if we can't do it um, physically on the site, if it architecturally proves or structurally proves that it's not salvageable, then hopefully at least our, back to our preservation objective, uh, the digital atlas can do something of, of preserving the women's stories in this place. Um, there are challenges associated with Magdalene research. Um, uh, again, as we discussed earlier, um, notably the fact that the records, the archival records of these sites are mostly held in private collections of the religious orders who have been very unwilling to grant access to researchers, as Jaeger and Cullin, that quote from Jaeger and Cullison uh, speaks to here, which is a problem for um, discussing architecture particularly. Sean McDermott Street site, fortunately, because it's a central Dublin site and it was one of the larger Magdalene laundries in operation in Ireland, is better documented than most. But the, the archival fragments, which still remain, are just that they are fragmentary and, and um, a bit scattered and it took quite a bit of, of sort of forensic sleuthing to dig up what little we could find. But nonetheless, we did find more on this site than we have on other Magdalene sites we've looked at. Um, and one of the main things that helped us in our, especially in our spatial understanding of the site, was the parts that remain. Uh, you can see here, this is a Google map shot from a couple of years ago, and you can see that while large parts of the site have been demolished here and even overbuilt here, this is a large block. Um, oops, sorry. oops, sorry, I got a ping there. Um, still large parts of the site remain, which is an invaluable architectural resource. Similarly, we have uh, in the Irish Architectural Archive in Dublin, we have some of the, the original drawings of, of the convent and, and the chapel, these really beautifully illustrated architects plans, um, notably that these are only for the, the quote unquote worthy or, or significant parts of the site, the site, parts of the site where the money was spent, the parts where the nuns were living or the religious ceremonies were taking place, very little the architectural documentation, certainly not to this quality of the women's dormitories, for example, or, or for the laundry buildings themselves. These sort of quasi-industrial spaces um, are not in anywhere near documented uh, to the same degree, but nonetheless still really valuable resource for investigating the spatial qualities of the site. As I mentioned, we also have these uh, these varying quality photographs from the 1920s of the inside of, of a couple of buildings at the laundry that were published to raise money, which is incredibly helpful. But of course, um, this is only just post-independence Ireland, and it was only in the years subsequent to this, the sites really took on their sort of punitive and carceral role. Um, we have, very fortunately, the home film of the local parish priest as well, which is held in the Irish Film Archive. Uh, and you see some shots of the, the laundry buildings ca captured in the background. Um, and you can freely um, access those it's on, under the Father uh, Jack Delaney collection in the IFI. Um, we also have the voices of the women themselves. And while the 2013 oral history project was not conducted with the intention that some PhD student uh, nearly 10 years later would come and, and try to write an architectural thesis on this, um, as Stein and Ryden note, oral histories can contain a wealth of spatial and architectural information, even when they're not intended for this purpose. When recounting events that happened, the interviewee tends to picture in their mind's eye the space where that that uh, inciting incident took place and often they will describe material or spatial details about it in their testimony um, and critically for our reconstruction we had two other pieces of evidence so um, Dublin City Corporation because they were trying to redevelop the site before the fire had commissioned a, a pretty um, pretty forensic um, metric survey of the outside of the site. So we knew the sort of the footprint of the buildings pretty, pretty accurately. And also they took a few photos. They're, they're very hard to get um, 
get copies of these. I got these from the planning um, submission for one of the initial projects. Uh, that's why it's quite pixelated, but nonetheless, I think hugely useful of some of the only photographic evidence we have of what the site looked like prior to the fire. Um, and that was just enough to to create a 3D reconstruction of the site. And, and just um, I hope I'm OK for time. Um, Please do get if if you if I'm starting to witter on, do give me a warning, uh, or shout and say, tell me to stop. Um, but basically, what we were able to do with these these two pieces of information, the the measured plan and um, and the the three D or the the color photography, we used a, a pretty snazzy uh, piece of software called FSpy, and effectively what that does is the rules of proportion are are mathematical rules. Thing you know the the whole vanishing point thing that things get smaller the further away they are. They're all mathematical co constructs, and you can reconstruct them through trigonometry. And luckily, the camera and the human eye obey the same rules in this regard. So while you, you would really struggle through this with pen and paper, there's some jazzy software there that can do this for you. And effectively, by um, putting this photograph that we had into the software and, and drawing the sort of the vanishing lines, so that the lines of, of parallel w w in real life are parallel lines, but in the photograph are, are converging uh, the further away they go, the computer can effectively reverse engineer the camera that took them and tell you where the camera was, what angle it was, uh, what sort of focal length and everything was used. Um, which is incredible that all this information on the site here and you can then import that information and recreate a digital version of that camera and situate it in a virtual world with the exact same parameters and the exact same angle and position and then looking through that digital camera in your 3d modeling software in this case we use blender which is a free open source software you can rebuild the what is pictured in the, the camera view and you can do it proportionately accurately there's a margin of error of course but um you know, you know that that window in, in this is is say one tall to a ratio of two wide, for example, it, it's it's all proportionally accurate. It doesn't know how big that building is for, for all it's concerned. That building could be a centimeter tall, it could be a meter tall, it could be a kilometer tall. Um, but luckily, as I said, we had the measured survey, so we knew exactly how how wide these buildings were and we were able to then use that to scale the information. So by doing that, of all the, the fragmentary sources we had, these the small snippets of pixel of photographs, um, the older photographs of the interiors, um, stills from the um, the home films from the local parish priest, we were able to basically go through the site pretty systematically and then come up with a fairly rigorous and, and detailed 3D reconstruction of the site. Then what we did, we hosted that on a website and we overlaid it with survivor testimony to situate the Mormon's voices onto the place where they happened to give them presence, to, to make them um, it, it's an odd word to use uh, tangible in, in the context of the digital, but I think that is what we're aiming for here. We're, we're locating these memories and spatializing them uh, and making them both accessible and impactful. I, that's certainly the intention. Um, just before I, I widely um, go over my time, uh, I think this quote is, is um, I, I find it really poignant and uh, I'll leave it on the screen just um, so people can read it in its entirety. But basically it's talking uh, it's one of the women recounting how one of her friends in the laundry uh, used to um, get the, the girls, the, the local boys on the street behind, uh, used to throw stones at them through the windows or th at the windows sort of as a way of, you know, annoying or abusing them. Um, and I find this quote really poignant for a number of reasons. And the first one is actually links back to something that we were discussing earlier, which is about how much did people on the outside know about what went on in the Magdalene laundries? Now, th this isn't addressing the question of did parents you know, send their daughters or their, their wives or what have you into the laundries, but it does speak to a broader social consideration, which is the boys knew that the women in this place were persona non grata. They may not have known exactly why they were imprisoned or concealed behind the walls of the convent laundry, but they knew that they were fair game for abuse. They knew that they could throw stones at them. That that in itself is a really telling piece of information. But also within this, and referring back to what I said before about architectural information concealed within oral histories, even if they're not intended for that purpose, um, there's enough in this quote that we can locate it pretty accurately onto our reconstruction of the site. Um, and that was really important to us. We wanted, we, we trolled through the five women's testimonies, which run to hundreds of pages of transcript um, to find and identify exactly where the uh, positions were located. I think that was really eloquently addressed in Rebecca's presentation just a moment ago. Um, and we didn't want to be illustrative. We didn't want to be general. Uh, we wanted to sort of specifically locate these testimonies as far as possible. Uh, Dara's sort of signaling me there that I'm running out of time. So I'll just, I'll quickly just mention here, we knew that this um, site, the, the boys were throwing stones from the road. So the site is bounded north and south um, on by road. So we knew it was either the north or the south side. The north side here is where the convent is. So we knew it couldn't be the north side. So we're on the southern flank of the site. 
and, and in a really nice little detail she throws in, it, she says it's a little square window. And within that, we're able to locate, there's only one building on the southern wall of the site, um, which has square windows. We're able to locate that pretty accurately. What we did, once we determined that accurately, we sort of overlaid the testimony on top of it in these little callouts, which you can freely explore um, on the website, which I will um, leave it there. That's the link to the Atlas of Lost Rooms. Please do check it out. It focuses around the 3D model. There's lots of other historical information at the site, which is or organized in a special way, um, but it focuses around that 3D reconstruction, which you can orbit around and read the women's testimonies for yourself. And, and hopefully you, you find it interesting. It'd be really interesting to hear your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christopher, for a really uh, insightful uh, analysis of, I guess, how do we create silence in some respect? And as you pointed out, uh, those issues are very present, even in terms of the case study to which you referred. So I'm sure there will be questions, comments um, to follow. So our next speaker is uh, Sarah McDonough from the School of Arts, English and Languages here at Queen's. And Sarah is going to speak um, to the title Digitization and Accessibility, Prisons Memory Archive Case Study. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dara. Um, and uh, thank you to, i really like to thank Lucy for uh, getting in touch and um, letting me know about this, um, this symposium. Um, I'm really delighted to be part of it today. Um, what I've heard so far has been so fascinating and um, I've learned a lot. So I'm really looking forward to presenting my research and then maybe getting some feedback from you and some comments. So I'll just share my slides. If Teams allows me. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah, it looks great. Great. Okay. So yes, so basically today I'm going to present um the work that I did with um an audiovisual archive in, um, in, in Queens called the Prisons Memory Archive. Um, it's also based in the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland as well. So um, this was um, very much um, uh, focused on accessibility um, for blind and partially sighted people. Although, as I'll discuss later on, um, this accessibility um, also um, was, was also important for, for sighted viewers as well. So I'll just go on to the next slide. So, <clears throat> so the Prisons Memory Archive um, holds uh, um, 160 filmed walk and talk recordings um, with those who pass through the prison system um, in Northern Ireland. So that includes um, the Maze Longkesh Prison for Men and also um, Armagh Jail for Women. Um, and this was during the 30 year conflict um, in Northern Ireland known as the Troubles. So back in 2006 and 2007, a group of filmmakers um, invited a range of people um, that included former prisoners. So both Republican and loyalist prison staff, visitors, educators, chaplains, journalists, lawyers um, to revisit the prisons and to recount their memories of these sites um, on site. So um, in addition then to the walk and talk recordings, the archive also holds um, an extensive collection of video footage of both prisons. Um, my research is specifically on the Mays Longkesh prison, which was the, the men's prison. So I'll be focusing on that in my talk today. Um, I'm conscious that I'm in a symposium with a lot of historians. <laughs> so um, I will provide a brief um, summary um, um, some context to the Maze Longkesh prison um, during the conflict. So the Maze Longkesh prison was one of the main sites um, during the Troubles and for almost 30 years it um, interned and detained, imprisoned those suspected of conflict related offences. Um, and this included both Loyalist and Republican, although Republicans did make up the majority of the prison population. Um, and many of these would go on then to redefine the political landscape of Northern Ireland. So the prison took centre stage in many of the um, confrontations between prisoners and government authorities. Um, and these included periods of intense um, political protests um, and also uh, hunger strikes, 
prison escapes, assassinations, sectarian violence, and then the eventual brokering of peace, um, peace talks, all of which um, shaped the course of the conflict. So um, that said, the prison itself remains um, a deeply uh, divisive symbol uh, in contemporary Northern Ireland, and it has been a side of contention um, between the two traditions of um, Republican nationalism and um, unionism. Um, so, as I said, the PMA holds an extensive collection of um, video footage of the Maison Cash prison. So given the ongoing contention over the meaning and significance of the prison in contemporary Northern Ireland, contextual information about the prison space in each video tour is kept minimal. So there's no um, spoken narration or voiceover. And according to the director of the PMA, Cahill McLaughlin, uh, this allows the viewer to interpret the prison space on their own terms. However, this approach uh, privileges those who can see, which places blind and partially sighted people at a significant disadvantage. So um, in order to begin to address this access, this clear access issue for people who are blind and partially sighted, um, through my research, I created some audio descriptions of the um, PMA uh, video tours. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar what, what, with what audio description is, Audio description offers um, an interpretation um, and verbal representation of essential visual information as it appears on the screen. So, for instance, I, if I were to describe myself today to you, I would say that I'm um, a relatively young uh, woman with um, her hair tied up, uh, my hair is brown, I'm wearing um, gold earrings. Um, I have a gold top on. Um, so that's just me just self describing. But to give you an example of how audio description has been integrated into the PMA, I'd just like to play you an example of the PMA archive um, trailer. Now, I should say that this trailer is taken from an earlier version of the website. It has since been updated. I'll put a link in the chat to the new website, but this will just demonstrate how audio description has been integrated into the PMA. So I'll just play it now for you. In association with Community Relations Council, Heritage Lottery Fund and Queen's University Belfast. I think there are ghosts in the maze. The maze itself is a ghost. It's a ghost of another time. A wide panoramic view of the entire maze Long Cash prison. With its extensive concrete walls, wire fences, exercise yards and admin buildings, the prison appears entirely grey. White letters appear against a black screen which reads the maze and Long Cash prison. A row of disused and abandoned Nissan huts. An empty fortified prison gate. Rusted razor wire has fallen from the concrete prison wall. 24 interviews. Outside, a man with his back turned prods the concrete pavement with his umbrella. An older man peers into a barred prison window. A woman enters the prison through an old fashioned turnstile. A man surveys the damage of a room where the roof has fallen in. Based on an ethos of co-ownership, life storytelling, and inclusivity. It's a time I've never really been able to come to terms with. It was as if they, the whole Northern Ireland conflict had focused itself on, on this particular piece of ground and on, the, on these particular buildings. Very, very painful memories, but memories that have to be kept and have to be talked about and have to be put into into the, our history. All is silent now, and the territory is left to the wildlife, to the foxes and the rabbits and the weeds and what have you. And the sound of fury is, is no more. But the sadness is in many people's lives on both sides of the community who've lost their families and loved loved ones, their fathers and sons and daughters and all the rest of it. And such was the closeness you felt to some of the prisoners. Maybe it was the sanctity of the cell. Remembering their time inside. I mean, they used to say, you know, you can't imprison the imagination, if you like, and you can't imprison the spirit through an interactive web page. 
a mice clicks on the word interactive. The prison's memory archive web page. The mice clicks and a pop-up screen appears. Prison's memory archive. Let's hope its future is got a its past. A grey-haired man in a dark prison corridor. I think that the last thing you would say about this place is last one out, turn the lights out. Gotta do it. The screen fades to black. So that's just an example of how audio description has been integrated into the PMA. Um, and now I'd just like to um, go on to talk about some of the challenges of actually creating the audio descriptions for the PMA video tours. So on this slide is a photograph from an event held back in 2017. So it was part of the Being Human Festival. And as part of this event, um, we showed um, a, an, an audience um, some audio descriptions of three um, video tours from the Maze Longkesh prison. So there was the um, compound, the hospital and H block video tours. So um, some of the challenges that we found with creating the audio descriptions was, of course, um, the contending narratives on the Maze Longkesh prison. So um, as I said before, the Maze Longkesh prison is still remains a deeply divisive um, symbol of Northern Ireland's past. So um, audio description guidelines normally describe the or normally advise the audio describer to just describe what they see. However, this is far too simplistic, really, in the context of Northern Ireland. So in order to provide access to these recordings, there needs to be a level of interpretation um, of the site to make it understandable and accessible to people who will avail of the audio descriptions. Um, in the case of the Maze and Longkesh prison, um, what we see isn't really reducible to the physical space of the prison, but also incorporates different understandings of the past in Northern Ireland that are oftentimes mutually exclusive. And this divisiveness really um, is borne out in the words that we use to describe the prison. You'll have noticed that I use um, the Maze Longkesh um, to describe the prison. Other people um, refer to it as the Maze, other people refer to it as Long Kesh. Um, the preference for which name the prison uh, for the prison that's used is often um, taken to be a signifier of the speaker's political views or acceptance of a particular narrative, whether official or unofficial. So, for example, um, prison officers um, and those you can see within the PMA archive normally refer to the prison by its official name um, of um, HMP Maze or the Maze. Um, whereas prisoners and their respective communities, um, both loyalist and republican, commonly refer to the prison as Long Kesh or the Kesh. So word choice then is really bound to questions of power and its subversion, as well as positionality. So that's a term that he borrowed from feminism, uh, feminist uh, theory and also um, post-colonial theory, um, which refers to how a person's identity, um, whether social, political, um, racial, influences how they perceive the world and their place within it. So with respect to the audio descriptions for the PMA video tours, um, we use both names, the Maze and Long Kesh, to refer to the prison. Um, and this example really just demonstrates the centrality of language um, in the Northern Ireland conflict and how that has lasting effects on how the prison figures um, uh, in public imagination, both positively and negatively. Another issue to bear in mind also was the issue of content selection. So, um, in this in this project, the purpose of the audio description was to guide the audience through the prison space. So drawing their attention to particular visual um, elements within each video tour. Um, now, this might appear initially straightforward, but uh, the reality is far more complex because audio description um, has to keep pace with the moving image. You might have noticed in um, the example that I provided that the audio description um, has to occur at the same time as the image. So there are are timing constraints to bear in mind and with those timing constraints that means then that the audio description needs to provide information in a succinct manner. So that means certain, Im certain visual um, information is prioritised over others and different content is prioritised over others. So where there is a form of content selection bias going on and when we talk about the prison this is a bit of an issue because um, 
deciding on what visual information to prioritize in each video tour invariably you know involves some degree of contextualization and that's really fraught with difficulty in Northern Ireland when narratives about the past and particularly the prison um, really um, often divide along political lines. So an example that illustrates this point is the hospital building. So while the hospital building is architecturally very similar to the H blocks, the hospital carries a greater political significance for Republicans. And that's because of its centrality um, in the lead up to um, and after the, the hunger strikes of 1981. So that's the place where 10 men died in um, protest against the removal of special category status. So this close alignment of the hospital building um, to the Republican movement comes at the expense of other less articulated and more marginalised discourses. Um, however, if we were to omit information about this period, that arguably raises a significant part of the prison's um, or the building's history. Um, even if it is a part of the history of the prison um, that only really privileges one side of the troubles. Conversely, overemphasis of the hunger strikes also risks reinforcing the dominant Republican narrative of heroic sacrifice um, in the face of British duplicity um, that is prevalent in Republican commemorative discourse. And this is, you know, this narrative of heroism is problematic because it, it ignores the role Republicans played during the Troubles as one of the main perpetrators of violence. So this tension was really borne out in conversations with um, audiences um, and um, through a series of workshops um, that I conducted throughout this research. So when audiences were prompted to give some feedback on the initial versions of the audio descriptions of the hostel building, many participants took issue with the reference to the hunger strikes. And they cited the exclusion of other lesser known narratives within the building. So for example, the stories of the prison staff and in response to this feedback, then the audio descriptions were amended in which it acknowledged the role of um, prison staff within the prison, while also drawing attention to um, the hospital's links with the hunger strikes, however controversial those may be. Um, OK, so then moving on in terms of audience feedback. So this was a first initiative in terms of making the archive more accessible to people who are blind and party sighted. So um, throughout the workshops, um, we collected some, um, some feedback from people and I'll just like to read what we have on the screen. So this is one quote from a participant. So um, I quote, it is vital that a historical location is made accessible to all sections of the community. And then the second quote here we have, what has been done so far has been a fantastic start and certainly lots more can be done. This is really interesting experience for both sides and for people with sight loss. And then finally, one quote here reads, um, it was excellent for the cited as it gave helpful direction and added focus. So this final, um, this final quote is quite interesting because what we found was, OK, of course, we were creating these audio descriptions for blind and party sighted people. But whenever we showed them to sighted audiences, they benefited, too, because it, it guided them through the prison space and it drew their attention to certain things that they might not have known about the prison buildings. Um, so it really demonstrated the broader applicability of audio description outside of its core user group. So. Um, with that in mind, I'd like to leave you just with some food for thought. Um, I'm kind of coming at this from the accessibility angle and in terms of engaging with audiences, that's what I'm that's what I'm interested in. So I have a few questions for you because I don't know, maybe if there's something you thought about in terms of making digital archives more accessible to people. Um, I have a, some questions here that maybe we could talk about after. So um, the first question is, how can we make digital resources accessible to different audiences? And then what are some of the opportunities and challenges to an inclusive approach to digitization? Um, and then thirdly, how might an inclusive approach to digitization encourage more people to access online resources? And then finally, what is the role of digital literacy in widening the appeal of online resources to harder to reach audiences? I know earlier in the talk, in the this symposium, um, we talked about research skills. Um, so I suppose that could kind of be included there in terms of um, the role of research skills and digital literacy in terms of widening the appeal of online audience of online resources. Because if these online resources resources are more accessible, then there could be more research then 
um, from from this. So um, that is everything. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, my contact details are there, um, and I look forward to hearing, um, hearing back from you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for a really wide-ranging um, presentation on this fascinating project. And again, some of the questions you posed at the end, I've been thinking about those as well, as I'm sure others have, and I'm sure that'll lead to questions in the, in the Q&A section. So our final speaker on this panel, we're delighted to say, is Hannah McAuliffe from Trinity College Dublin, the School of History. And Hannah is going to speak to us on Kelp, the benefits and pitfalls of using digitized panels in the research of medieval Irish ancient. Hannah. Hi, yeah, I'm just going to share my screen so that um, you can see my presentation. Hopefully this will work. Perfect. Sorry, now my computer doesn't want to cooperate. There we go. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see we can see the screen. Yeah, Thank perfect. You, Hannah. Perfect. Um so, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, thanks to Lucy for organizing the symposium and thank you to Dara for the introduction. Um, my name is Hannah McAuliffe and I'm working on my PhD in Trinity College Dublin with a particular interest in the early medieval period in Ireland. Um, as far as I can gather, I'm the only medievalist speaking today. Um, so this might be a little bit different than what else, uh, than everything else that you've been hearing today. Uh, what I'm looking at in my research is the ways in which medieval Irish dynasties the group splintered and broke up um, in the early medieval period and how this had a direct impact on the patterns of succession to regional and petty kingships um, that we see occurring in this period in Irish history. For example, in a selection of kingships, including the kingships of Tara and Leinster, and power would alternate back and forth between two dominant royal lines for periods of time. So if a member of line A was king, he would be succeeded by a member of line B, um, and so on and so forth until um, uh, a different dominant line would come to power. Despite the fact that medieval Irish kingship has been extensively researched um, with quite a few well-received monographs like Bart Yasky's Early Irish Kingship and Succession and Francis Byrne's Irish Kings and High Kings tackling the topic, there's been very little focus on actually cataloguing um, succession patterns that you see in medieval Ireland. And so that's what I'm hoping to do with my project. That's also the context of what I'll be talking about today, um, which is the digitization of the Corpus of Medieval Irish Annals on the UCC Celt database. So the annals really are a blessing for scholars of the medieval period in Ireland. Sources are in general extremely limited for the period. Um, and while we do have a lot of kind of mythological sagas, legal texts and genealogical documents for the period, the annals are kind of the only real source that give us a proper insight into events on the ground in Ireland in the medieval period. The annals take the form of short accounts of events in any given year. Um, in the words of Kathleen Hughes, the entries are usually rather laconic in nature. Um, they tend to withhold details in favour of space-saving single line entries, especially because um, scribal materials were so expensive at the time. Uh, very often you'll get entries like this one on the screen here, um, which reads, Jonal son of Waylon, king of the day she died. That's uh, all you get, that's all the information you get in this entry. Um, it tells us very little else about the circumstances of the event. And these are the kind of entries you find most often in the annals. Uh, uh, nonetheless, they are very important records for medieval Ireland. And they tell us a lot about weather events 
events like droughts and storms and they detail celestial events like eclipses and um, comets going over those kinds of things um, as well as battles and the deaths of important religious and political figures. It's theorized that uh, animals developed from notes made by monks in the margins of paschal tables. Paschal tables were um, tables of dates and years used to keep track of the date of Easter each year and there's an example of one of the Irish Pascal tables um, on the screen now. Um, according to Catherine Sims, the existing manuscripts of the annals that we have today date from the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries, but they are a product of the layered process of copying and recopying over the centuries. So basically they were compiled and copied um, based on much earlier um, analytic uh, documents. As products of regional monasteries, they often reflect the biases of the scribes involved in their production, um, and as a result, we do have to treat them very carefully as historic sources. That doesn't negate their usefulness as sources, however. Um, the extant annals are usually based on much earlier copies, as I was saying, of now lost annals and chronicles, um, and without them, we would be very much in the dark um, as to the uh, kind of political ongoings of medieval Ireland. Um, the corpus of Irish annals is quite expansive. There's quite a few different copies of major and minor annals. Um, but for the purposes of today's paper, I'll be uh, referring to the four kind of major sets of annals. They are the annals of Tiernock, the annals of Ulster, the annals of Inish Fallon, and the annals of the Four Masters. I think if I tried to include any more in this paper, we might have been here all day. So as I said before, the focus of this talk is the Celt digital database and its role in researching medieval Ireland in particular. In particular. Uh, we're very lucky in Trinity College and in most Irish universities that we have access to large libraries and manuscript collections. Um, during the pandemic, however, it has become abundantly clear that uh, we're also very fortunate to have this Celt database that I'm going to be talking about. Celt, which stands for the Corpus of Electronic Texts, is run by University College Cork and it was launched to, and I quote, bring the wealth of Irish literary and historical culture to the internet in a rigorously scholarly and user-friendly project for the widest possible range of readers and researchers. As uh, so you can see, the focus of the project is accessibility. Um, and true to this statement, users can access a huge range of Irish texts on the site, including the collections of Irish annals. The annals are usually accessible in book form, um, having been edited and translated by several respected names in the field, including Gerard and Mike Nagel, uh, Sean McArt and John O'Donovan. Uh, but for those that access to well-stocked university libraries, um, they're much more difficult to access. Celt, which is designed to cater for academic scholars, teachers, students and the general public, allows access to these valuable sources regardless of location or circumstance. Celt is undoubtedly a triumph for accessibility in the field of medieval studies, uh, but it isn't without its problems. Uh, one of the first issues researchers encounter when navigating the site is the fact that each set of annals is uploaded to the website without their editor's footnotes, and notes, indices, and introductions. Published copies of the annals are usually edited by scholars with experience in the fields of medieval and Celtic studies, and this enables them to include appropriate corrections to dates, inter introductions with discussions of the annals provenance, and indices with the details of place and personal names referred to in the text. This allows scholars, as well as users unfamiliar with the sources, to interpret the content from as informed a position as possible. Um, if we take the annals of the Four Masters, for example, um, Having been compiled in the 17th century, they were heavily edited by their scribes. Um, references to regional kings, or re, um, were replaced with lords and chieftains, or Tirna and um, Taoiseach. And this was done in order to inflate the position of the high king in Irish history. If you look at this example on the PowerPoint, um, it's really clear um, that you can see uh, the difference between um, the annals of the four masters and the annals, uh, the other um, older Irish annals. Um, so what we have here is an uh, entry from the annals of Tiernach. It translates to um, the Battle of Balak Ela between Munster and Leinster, where many Leinster men and almost and an almost countless number of Munster men perished, wherein Kellock, son of Fuelker, king of Ossory, fell, and two sons of Cormac Rossa, king of the Daishi, fell. Cahal, son of Fingwina, king of Munster, escaped. You can really clearly see um, 
in this entry, um, I have them circled here, that uh, the author refers to Kellogg and Cormac as re osurga and re nadeshi, um, which is a word that's still in use in modern Irish today, and we would understand it to mean king. If you look at the Annals of Four Masters version of events, however, um, the entry translates to the Battle of Bellock Ela was fought between Cahos and Afinguina, King of Munster, and the Leinstermen, where many of the Leinstermen were slain. There fell of the Munstermen here, Kellogg, son of Felgar, chief of Osirga, and two sons of Cormac, son of Rossa, chief of the Daishi, with 3,000 along with them. Again, I have it circled in the image there. Um, you can really clearly see that the scribe calls the two men Tishak Osirga and Tishak Naneshi, um, which is a word that uh, you're probably still familiar with today because it's still used in Irish politics. Um, and it's a word that we would understand to mean more like chieftain or lord as opposed to king. John O'Donovan, who edited the Annals in the Annals of the Four Masters in the 1850s, includes a very detailed introduction to the text in his edition. Um, and this introduction highlights the issues with the source um, and he details its history and its provenance. In addition to this, O'Donovan knew Use his past experience working with the Ordnance Survey um, to include um, lots of in-depth notes on place names and locations in the annals. You can see some examples of them there. He tended to include them in the footnotes um, whenever he would come across a place name in uh, the annals of the Four Masters. The Annals of Inish Fallon are another really good example of this, as um, editor and translator Sean McGart includes a very useful index of place names in the back of his edition. All of these editors' notes are excluded, um, are omitted on the Celt database. Throughout their history, the annals were constantly edited and added to uh, by successive scribes and compilers. Uh, they're riddled with non-contemporary interpolations, for example. Um, one good example of this, as Dovio Cronin uh, pointed out, um, is a record of St. Colum Kill's birthday, um, which was recorded in the year 520. This uh, is an unusual entry in general because uh, we don't usually see the births of saints and uh, politicians, kings, the likes, recorded in the annals. Um, and it is now uh, theorised that this must have been inserted at a later date by scribes to align it with the fact that another entry in the annals states that Colum Kill died in 597 at the age of 77. So a lot of the time you see inconsistencies because the scribes were trying to um, trying to make it look more consistent um, for the readers. The char this character of the annals means that the key to making effective use of them as historical sources is to consult the editor's notes. And without them, researchers are severely limited in what they can do with the information in the annals. Celt does attempt to counter this issue. Um, at the beginning of each set of annals, they provide a clear list of all translations, editions, manuscripts, and secondary material pertaining to the source. And um, you can see some of them on the screen now. Um, for researchers with access to necessary resources, it is then possible to cross-reference the information presented on Celt uh, if desired. One of the areas in which Celt really shines is in the provision of English translations for each of the annals. One of the benefits of the website is the fact that translations are available as a separate web page, making it easy to navigate one or the other, while also facilitating side-by-side -side comparison on the screen. Um, and you can see uh, that on the PowerPoint now. Uh, if we compare the um, system of presenting translations uh, to the various cumbersome ways in which translations have been presented in print, um, it becomes clear how Celt can be of benefit to uh, researchers. Uh, possibly the most difficult of the uh, translations is the one presented by Whitley Stokes in his edition of the Annals of Tiernock. You can see an excerpt from uh, Stokes edition on the screen now. Um, Stokes has his English translations in brackets and they're interspersed at random points among the original text of the annals. Um, this makes it incredibly difficult to follow the train of the entries. Um, and as Kathleen Hughes describes it, it makes Stokes edition at best tiresome to use. So that's definitely a major bonus of the Celt system that it's um, easier to navigate translations um, and uh, work with either translation or original language, depending on your um, experience level. As highlighted by Catherine Sims in her very useful book, Medieval Gaelic Sources, uh, the annals are thwarted by issues in translation in general. 
A huge amount of these problems are down to the fact that until the late 19th century, Old and Early Middle Irish were not very well understood by scholars of um, early Ireland. This means that some annals written in early modern Irish, such as those of the Four Masters, were accurately translated in the 19th century, uh, while others in older forms of Irish, such as the Annals of Tiernock and the Annals of Ulster, needed later retranslation. If we take, for example, the Annals of Ulster, um, these annals were originally translated into English in the late 19th century by two um, scholars called William Monsell Henry and Bartholomew McCarthy. After publication, the translation was, was met with significant criticism and Hennessy's work on the earliest section of the text was dismissed as an unsatisfactory translation. As a result, Sean McCart and uh, later Gerard McNeagle uh, began work on a new translation of the annals and this was published in 1983. You can see the differences in translation on the PowerPoint right now. Um, Hennessy often cut out a lot of material from the original uh, text um, and he regularly misinterpreted the Irish in the Annals of Ulster. This is a major advantage of Celt, um, that they only present the most recent translations of the Annals on their website. Uh, uh, for example, Whitley Stokes' difficult translation of the Annals of Tiernock that I've just been speaking about, um, it has been replaced on Celt by um, an unpublished edition translated by Gerard McNeagle uh, much more recently. This removes much of the concern for erroneous material in older translations, um, and it makes the annals far more accessible to users unfamiliar with Latin and older forms of Irish language. Older translations are also listed in the bibliographic details of each set of annals, and that means that researchers can then go and cross-check translations um, if and when they need to. In another time for accessibility, Celt makes the annals easily searchable. Thanks to user-friendly interface, it is remarkably easy to navigate the annals online. And um, if a researcher wants to view all of the events recorded in a set of annals for one particular year, for example, it's possible to pull up the contents of this one year using the sidebar to the left of the screen. It's also possible to view the entire document at the click button, which I find particularly useful when searching for all references to one specific person or thing. So, for example, if I'm looking for all references to the Deity Muin, who were a kingdom in medieval Waterford, um, in the Annals of Inish Fallon, for example, I simply pull up the entire document. I hit Control F on my keyboard that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, key in my search term, and I'm immediately presented with all references to that exact phrase in the document. Celt also contains its own built-in search feature, allowing users to find all documents on the website containing reference to their search terms. This is really useful for if you're trying to find your primary sources to begin with when you're doing initial research for a new project. This all cuts out a huge amount of time associated with reading through the annals line by line um, and does allow a certain degree of um, uh, more efficient time management in research. It does, however, present another problem that um, we have to keep in mind when using search features on the Celt website. Um, while reading through the annals one entry at a time is time consuming, it is the only way to ensure that small inconsistencies in spelling and dating are not overlooked. With the search feature, this is not possible as only exact matches for search terms are displayed. The annals are riddled with spelling inconsistencies in general. If we use the Daisy as our example again, um, it can be presented across the annals um, as any one of the following. Daisy spelled D-E father I-S-I, Daisha spelled D-E father I-S-E, Daisy spelled with two S's or Daisha spelled with two S's. Even within sets of annals, you can find it spelled more than one way. So if you look at the table I have on screen, you can see that while each set of annals favors one spelling, uh, there are always some inconsistencies no matter how small they are. Using the search function, these small deviations from standard spelling would be missed um, and uh, oftentimes the entries including these uh, small deviations are the most important. This issue becomes even more apparent when consulting the original Irish text. As a result of the influence of grammatical case on spelling, as well as erroneous deviations from standard spelling, it is impossible to find all references to one word in the Irish versions of the texts using a search function alone. Compared to the English versions, the deviations in this table all occur. So you can see that there are five different spellings used in both the Annals of Ulster and the Annals of Tiernock. And while the Annals of Inish Fallon and Annals of the Four Masters have less inconsistencies, there are still two or three variants, uh, different variations in use in both. 
very same can be said for complex Irish personal names. If we take Gyar na Gwynog, um, which is a king of the Daishi Muin, as an example, this becomes clear. In the English translation of the Annals of Inish Fallon, the name is spelt G E R R N A C U I N N E O F A D C. You can see that on screen there. In the Annals of the Four Masters, it is spelt G E A R R N A G C E U I N N E O G. And again, you can see that on screen. The original Irish versions of these uh, annals, however, spell the name differently again with G E R R. N-A-C-U-N-N-E-O-C and G-E-R-R-N-A-C-C-U-I-N-N-E-O-G-H um, appearing in both. If one was to attempt to search the standardized spelling of Gerne Gwynog on Celt, um, they would be faced with zero results because um, the variations are so significant. The searchability of the Celt database is useful for gaining a general overview of the animal's contents, um, but we can't rely upon it. Um, as our only method of research. So to wrap up, um, Celt is an incredibly useful resource for historians of medieval Ireland, especially during this pandemic, but also during quote unquote normal times. It allows us to access a body of hugely important sources that provide us with the best available insight into medieval Ireland, um, provide translations and original text on an easily navigated interface. As with any digital database, the website has some problems, particularly in the presentation of edited texts, but for the most part, issues are down to the inconsistent nature of the annals themselves. Today, I've only talk, spoken about spelling inconsistencies in the annals, but there's also a wealth of scholarship on inconsistencies in dating and chronology in the annals that would also present issues when uh, using the Celts database. Um, and I suppose what it really comes down to is how well equipped the users of Celt are to tackle the issues presented by the annals, both online and in print. Uh, those unfamiliar with the sources will, of course, encounter problems, while those more experienced in the field might find less of an issue with the things I've been talking about today. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them at the end. Um, but that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah, for such a wide-ranging and comprehensive um, presentation on, on Celt, a subject for our two, I'm sure we're all very familiar, but it was fascinating to get those insights into the uses of, of, of Celt, how to optimize our, our use of all that um, of our two. So we're going to come to the Q&A momentarily. Um, whoever uh, has seen it ask to the panel chair to come in and give a brief overview in a matter of ten minutes of um, our particular experiences and or expertise in working with digital history while you put questions for the speakers. Um, so in about 60 seconds, I'm just going to give you an insight into one of the projects which I've been working on, which uh, deals with digital history um, in a different way, perhaps, to some of our speakers uh, this afternoon. And that relates to the Global Irish Revolution Project, um, which I've been working on at Queen's University Belfast with Bergen McGarry which is also tied to the University of Edinburgh and Professor Enda Delaney. And that was a three-year project which sought to explore the impact and influence of the Irish Revolution around the world, but also the impact of the Irish diaspora on the um, events in Ireland itself. One of the partners um, which we worked with was Century Ireland, and I've posted a link in the chat here to a website which we developed with our partners, uh, Century Ireland, which is basically a Boston College Ireland um, platform. And we developed this website, which showcases the latest research which we are conducting in the global Irish Revolution, um, and also allowed us to um, bring other collaborators to the table in terms of publishing uh, new essays, audiovisual features, uh, and so on. So, um, as editor of the global Irish Revolution page of Century Ireland, which I should add, posted on the part of the website, I've developed a new series. Um, of Global Archives, um, which Lucy mentioned in her introduction. And this will um, begin from this summer of 2021, essentially. And the idea is to showcase the archival materials that relate to the Irish Revolution primarily, but perhaps going forward, they have, may have a broader remit to uh, showcase and thereafter digitize collections around the world in modern Irish history. But at the moment, we're focusing on the Irish Revolution. And based on the relationships which I've developed with archives around the world, having had the opportunity to explore archival materials from um, the United States to Japan. And so, so far, 10 archives, libraries, or, and or museums have signed up to this project. The idea is to showcase uh, a particular collection within an archive 
on the RTD Global Irish Revolution site, um, which will entail a, uh, an archivist's report of about 1,050 words, in which the archivist or librarian or curator will um, provide an overview of a specific collection within their archive, which deals with the Irish Revolution, um, the provenance, uh, the history of collecting, um, the uh, other related materials, but also then in uh, about five or six hundred words, detail the specific um, documents, objects, or texts within their collection, which um, which provide a, a new insight into our understanding of the Irish Revolution, and that's done in terms of. Um, a specific case study within the overall report, but also um, digitization of a select group of materials, which will be published on the RTD website. Um, most of those documents which will be publishing will have already been published on the archives website, for example, and we'll just be showcasing that to a, a, a more a broader audience, a more diverse audience, um, and a transnational audience. Um, and also contact details of the archivist, the library, or museum of fashion was provided. And the idea, again, is to highlight archives, which are outside of Ireland, which Irish researchers, but also the Irish public more generally, would not necessarily be aware of. And then going forward, the Davies Hope for Digitization, potentially in collaboration with the Digital Repository of Ireland, and going forward, um, would yet to be discussed. But this is a major symphony project, which will hopefully uh, give Irish researchers based in Ireland, especially in COVID time, the opportunity to travel to the world of archives um, internationally from their homes and make it accessible and useful to people all over the world. So with that said, uh, we'd like to open the panel with five to ten minutes to ask questions for our, for our speakers. And if you have a question, please raise your hand for our uh, four panel speakers this afternoon. We get spoke so expertly and so eloquently um, on a range of different projects, which are again dealing with very um, current commemorative issues of the standing for historical importance. So, have any questions or comments from the group? Uh, Connor, Connor Murphy, and Ray Connor. Um, hi, hello. I'd just like to say all four presentations were brilliant. Um, Christopher, in particular, if you don't mind, I just I thought yours yours was great, absolutely brilliant. Um, and it's to my shame that that I wasn't previously there at the Atlas of Rooms, um, and, it's really good at it and it's superb. Um, as you were talking about your project, I reminded of Laura McIntyre's work on archaeology and heritage as tools of transitional justice in, in the Magdalen Laundry. And she described her experience of visiting the derelict Donnybrook laundry with some survivors. And one of the survivors said that she got the, although the building was empty, of course, she got the feeling that the nuns were just behind her, that they were actually watching her. Um, and my question is, have you received any feedback um, from survivors on the Atlas of Rooms? And if so, does the digitized module, does the digitized model evoke the somewhat eerie feeling that the actual building does? That's that's a really good question. Uh, and I think, Connor, you've uh, thank you very much for the question and the kind words. Um, you, you've kind of, in a way that I'm really envious of, actually, you've basically summed up what I'm planning to do for the rest of my PhD. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. I, 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 hopefully that got on the recording because I'm going to have to write that down. Um, I do know Laura very well personally. She's been a great friend and mentor to me. Funnily enough, she actually uh, also, to show how these are all linked together, she also worked uh, for the PMA previously. She was the architect for the Maze Long Cache and is interviewed in one of the recordings. Um, I was with Laura, not that time when she was in Donnybrook, um, but we visited the site together. Um, and she's uh, she's an amazing help. And, and she's very friendly as well, so I'd encourage you to reach out to her. Um, she's, she's always very willing to help these things, although she's very busy. Um, as to the interviewing survivors, uh, the short answer is no, we haven't, that we intend to, uh, and not just this site. Uh, this was the, the reason ultimately why we, we publicised this and it became more of a public engagement tool um, because it was a thing that we could show people. The, the 
the methodology of reconstructing the sites is, is part of my PhD research. That's why it's the pilot study. The intention is to conduct interviews, hopefully with survivors and migrant women in the presence of these digital models to see if that can recall, as Laura did when she took them to, to the site of Donnybrook. Uh, they, they recalled more in the presence of the memory, the site where the memory was first encoded. That's I mean, that's again very relevant to the, what the PMA does. Um, the problem with the Maglin sites is that they've either been completely demolished, they're derelict and therefore unsafe, uh, or they've been aggressively redeveloped and not much is left. And also the women often, as you rightly identified, have left and fled internationally and then flying them back. The, the Donnybrook women were flown back by the property developer who's taking on the site and they paid all the considerable expenses of bringing people back. And it was, it was still unable to get two women. Um, so the digital model offers, hopefully, the, the hypothesis that we're wanting to test is can we a, make something portable that we can bring to them, but also a way of, of you know, recreating sites that no longer exist in the physical reference. Can we do something of that um, memory evocation or digital prompting with a 3D reconstruction? It's an open question. The signs are positive, but you, I think you, you touched it there as well. It, may, it probably will never be as good as bringing the site because you don't have that tactility, you don't have the signs or the smells, um, but we're hoping it'll do something. And even if it doesn't, if it's a null result, I mean, that's, of course, interesting in and of itself. Uh, the reason we haven't done that is just because, as you, I'm sure you know yourself, this is massively ethically sensitive. So we're getting all our chickens in, in order before we put the full ethics review into Queens to get permission to then go out to the women. Uh, so if you, if you want to, you know, drop your contact details, I'm very happy to be corresponding about this if you're interested in, in following it forward. And I, I, I'd love um, that. Thank so you. That, that's that's congratulations up. again. Thank you so much. It's great to see these collaborations emerge di digitally, which I'm sure is what Lucy had uh, anticipated in organizing uh, this event. Any further questions for us? Um, Thank you. Um, so one of the things that came to mind, and then maybe something that we addressed after this video, for example, is the issue of leadership. Um, I think a number of you referred to, you know, um, feedback from um, from users, participants, uh, stakeholders, and so on. And given that digitization and the, um, the use of digital technology are changing so rapidly, I guess one of the questions I had, again, maybe something that we might be able to address at the end of today's session in the, in the round table, um, in respect of each of your participants today, is how you communicate the expectations of your project to uh, stakeholders. Um, and I'm thinking as well of generational differences, potentially in terms of older people who are not necessarily um, you know, as much at ease perhaps with digital technology. Um, so how do you communicate expectations? Uh, what you know, what do they anticipate the use are, the availability of their terms of oral archives will be uh, written testimonies and so on. And um, again, perhaps we can circle back to that with a broader round table discussion at the end. I know we're um, tight on time. So I, I think we'll just bring this panel to the conclusion for the moment. And I'm sure there are questions for our panelists to come back to you at the end of the keynote. This remains to thank again our, our four panel speakers for a really uh, forensic, um, innovative, and, and far reaching uh, presentations on four very different projects. And again, to kind of circle back to my comments earlier, which I gather were not um, audible to the panel. Thanks again, Lucy, for organizing this uh, for this event. The ideas, the genesis, the development of this digital event were entirely hers, and I'm delighted to be small part in that. So, Lucy, over to you now for the final session. Thank you, Dara, and thank you um, for everybody that presented in that panel. Um, it was uh, so enjoyable, and I really learned so much. Um, from that, now I'm going to hand over um, to um, Dr. Lisa Marie Griffith. So um, when I was uh, organising uh, the symposium, I thought it would be great if we could kind of close by bringing um, kind of all the thoughts and themes um, that were raised during uh, the day um, together. Um, and I thought there would be uh, no better um, organisation to hear from um, than the Digital Repository of Ireland. Um, which is a national digital repository of Ireland's humanities. Um, and um, uh, when they got back to me to say um, that not only somebody could um, come and speak, but it was uh, Lisa, I was delighted. Some of you uh, may be aware of um, some of her publications. So she um, uh, 
uh, studied at uh, University College Dublin, where she got her PhD. Um, uh, sorry, where she got her master's and um, her PhD in uh, uh, Trinity. Um, and she um, has published uh, the history of Dublin in ten buildings, um, and uh, uh, two edited collections. Um, leaders of uh, the city and death and dying in Dublin, which I uh, particularly enjoyed. Um, she um, works for the DRI and she is here today to share um, some of her knowledge and insight before um, leading um, us in a, a group discussion um, in the form of a round table. Um, so yeah, Lisa, welcome to you. We're so thankful that you can join us today um, to share your knowledge and insight. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, I'm just going to try share my presentation. OK, can you see that? Um, can you hear me OK? Yep, super. So I'm really delighted to be here this afternoon, although I will have to say I would rather actually be in Queens. Um, it was so nice of you to think of DRI um, and to invite us. So thank you very much, Lucy. Um, I will have to say that I've today and I've been running in between um, this and um, the Dublin City Council um, Heritage Strategic Working Group which is drawing up um, a plan for the next five years for heritage in the city. So it was so lovely hearing um, from you and being at that and kind of tying together some of the threads. Um, so just to say a little bit I guess about um, what I do at DRI, so I'm program manager, so that really means I do a little bit of everything. Um, I liaise with our members, I get involved in the education and outreach program, um, the kind of strategic direction of DRI. Um, so I'm going to say that I wear lots of hats, but I'm an expert in none of them. So I'll kind of say that at the start and I'm happy to bring back any more technical questions that people have. Um, to our wider team and answer them if there's anything that I can't answer. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about DRI and what we do. Um, so I suppose to begin, one of the really important things to highlight is that DRI um, is a repository for the long term preservation for digital objects um, relating to culture, heritage, humanities, social science and the arts. And I'm going to put a real emphasis there on long term preservation because um, it's been really interesting hearing about all of the different repositories that people are building through their research. And you might wonder what is the difference between the digital repository and um, some of these um, smaller or more local repositories or even an institutional repository where you might be um, using and, and sending some of your research. Well, at DRI, we not only um, provide access to a wide range of collections, we long term preserve digital assets. Um, and so the idea is anytime a, a cultural asset is created in a digital way, we have to think about preserving that. So it's not just about putting a piece of paper um, in an archive. And of course, that's a hugely complex process, but we need to think about how we um, long term preserve something that is is digital and in DRI and um, the way that we do that is we have a, a process of triple storage. Everything that goes into our repository um, is backed up in three different ways on different sites to make sure that if one or even two of these sites go down and um, the digital assets are preserved. Um, and we are a core trust seal certified repository um, and that's a really important distinction to make as well. This means that an external global uh, certification body has looked at us, has looked at what we do and they say um, that the DRI is somewhere that is trustworthy for putting your data in the long term. So we have been recognised as a piece of national data infrastructure um, so I guess that recognition really is saying that um, we are as important as some of the bricks and mortar um, archives that are out there. So we are part of the national landscape of archives um, and we are funded by the higher education authorities and the Irish Research Council. 
Um, so we're also um, a cross campus or a cross um, institutional organization. So we're headquartered at the Royal Irish Academy, which is where I usually work. Um, but we also have our technical team is at Trinity College Dublin and we have staff at Maynooth University as well. And I think this is something that we really draw a lot of our strength from the fact that we are based at three different institutions um, and that we draw expertise from all three institutions. Um, so I mentioned that we um, preserve Ireland's social and cultural data um, through digital collections, but we also preserve humanities, social science and arts data or research data um, in the repository. Um, and it's important to say we don't just take data in, we of course share that data um, through the repository portal and we make those collections open and accessible. Um, and an, another important thing to mention is that we are a national aggregator for Europeana. Um, so I'm not sure um, how many of you know of Europeana. I'm sure lots of you have come across Europeana, but it is um, a portal that brings together um, metadata and um, resources from all over Europe based on particular themes. And Europeana is very important because it allows us um, a kind of broader European um, look at, um, I suppose it facilitates researchers to have a broader European look from both the historical and cultural perspective. So what a national aggregator does is if you put your collections in DRI, you have the option of also sending them out to the Europeana portal. And that means that anybody who's searching through Europeana could also um, come across you. So we have curated collections and cross searchable metadata and a really important part of what we do is that we provide open access um, and we're strong believers um, in open research. So we're also a research centre for best practices. Um, we share everything that we do around digital preservation. So um, any of the code um, that we write for the repository is shared openly. Um, we share all of our archiving and metadata standards. In fact, we were worked very collaboratively, collaboratively when DRI was founded um, to come up with um, kind of widespread metadata standards to try and make it easier for people to um, ingest their collections into DRI. Um, we also, um, once the collections are in DRI, um, we, the collections I, I suppose are um, um, exhibited through the repository. Um, we're very active in education training and outreach. Um, we're also very active at a national and a European level um, for advocacy um, and policy. And one of the areas that we've become very involved in is um, open science. So the National Open Research Coordinator is currently located within the DRI staff. Um, so at a European level, there is um, a broader um, movement at the European Commission to push for all research that is funded um, by governments and the Europe to be made open access. So the idea behind this is to make sure that there are no barriers um, to research, that if you are being paid by public funds to create um, research, um, you need to be sharing that with the public and that there should be nothing hidden behind that. Um, and DRI is helping to create um, a roadmap for how Ireland is going to do this. Um, so what is in DRI? Well, we have um, a bit of everything really. Um, so we have um, business records, images, diaries, letters. We have audio and visual material, um, oral histories. We have artwork. We have um, material objects, clothing. And we're really delighted that one of the new features that DRI has is the ability to store long term preserve 3D images and to display those images um, out. And I think um, this is particularly important. Um, sorry, this is particularly important in light of 
um, some of the fires that we've seen really in the last five years that have destroyed national um, sites of national importance like Notre Dame, um, but also um, the National Museum of Brazil, which of course lost huge numbers of collections. So our ability to actually store 3D objects means that we're moving towards building collections and preserving um, a lot more 3D content. Um, and we have a huge amount of 3D content around the island. So it's a matter of trying to collect that and, and get a bit more of a going. So that could be 3D content from national monuments. Um, or clothing um, or material objects themselves. So we're also, I guess, or would like to think certainly that we are pushing the boundaries of digital archiving. So I wanted to talk a little bit about two of DRI's current research projects. Um, so one of the projects um, that we launched in January is Archiving Reproductive Health, which is funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, and this project is looking at archiving all of the material around the repeal the eighth campaign. So that's social media posts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, it's looking at media articles, communications, podcasts. And we're doing that with a group of stakeholders. Um, so these are groups that both advocated um, in support of repealing the Eighth Amendment, um, but also um, who sought to keep the Eighth Amendment in place. Um, and we want to create a holistic archive um, around the campaign itself. And I suppose um, this really recognises um, the place that social media had in this campaign. So hopefully what we're collecting really is, you know, it's the history of the future. And we understand as well that a lot of the content around the Repeal the Eighth Movement um, was ephemeral and that this has to be captured quite quickly. Um, now, it might feel like we're actually a little bit behind in capturing it, but we are developing at the moment a rapid response um, archiving policy that will allow us to go out and to archive as much ma ephemeral material um, as we possibly can around contemporary um, topics and issues that are coming up with the idea that really, I guess we're archiving future history. Um, and there's also a lot of difficulty around how you might archive a Twitter feed or how you might archive a Facebook feed. Um, apart from the fact that a lot of the social media companies don't actually like people to be taking content like this and archiving it because they see themselves as the owners of that content. Um, there's also a lot of sensitivity around it. Um, and so we're looking into investigating and exploring those issues to create the Archiving Reproductive Health Project. Um, the second um, project that we actually launched um, this month, and it kicked off last week, is the Enrich Europeana Plus project. Um, and this sounds to me anyway, as a, as a historian, very futuristic in that it will allow um, it will allow transcriptions um, of handwritten sources um, to be undertaken by AI, but it also encourages crowdsourcing of transcription services with the idea that a computer is going to learn um, from um, a human uh, transcribing this and the um, AI will pick that up and be able to transcribe larger amounts of these documentary sources. And we're working very closely with Dublin City Library and Archives um, to get sets of handwritten sources um, to transcribe. So um, how do you find material in the repository? So most collections can be accessed through the web interface um, of the repository. So if you go to dri.ie, um, you'll find the repository services um, on the top level of the website. Um, it's worth saying that some collections contain restricted data. Um, so these are collections that might have very sensitive material. Um, so one example of a collection like this is growing up in Ireland. So this is a collection or it's a, a social science project that was undertaken for 10 years. 
Um, so in an attempt to assist the Irish government in assessing what they needed for children in the future, um, a sample of children were selected and um, social scientists went out and interviewed the children and their parents at different age groups. So it's a hugely valuable collection. It teaches us an awful lot about future needs, um, but it, it's also going to be a hugely important historical source. Um, but of course, it has a lot of information about children, which has been anonymized. Um, but to access this, it's still restricted data. So as a researcher, you would have a legitimate right to access this material and you can apply to be given access to it. So it's still open, um, but we have safety measures in place. Um, and then um, just to say that DRI accepts four metadata standards, including uh, Dublin Core, MODS, EAD and MARCS XLM. We also have a huge number of publications to try and um, help people who are using the repository. Um, and I guess these publications represent the kind of broad area of interest that we have. So there are publications about archiving um, metadata standards, um, file storage, um, about uh, digital humanities, open science, um, and they might sound very theoretical, but when you come yourself to actually creating a digital um, archive and a digital record, you need to be thinking about metadata um, at a very basic level um, and moving up from there. So we see our publications as, as kind of helping people to get started on that journey. But we also run a number of education and outreach events, um, which will hopefully assist people with that too. Um, so where do our collections come from? Um, so at the moment, DRI is a member, uh, a membership based organization. And what that means is that in order to um, put your collections in DRI, um, you have to be one of our members. Um, so this was something that the government required us to do. Uh, at the moment, the kind of long term storage of um, digital items is a bit of an unknown. So we have a, a membership scheme where people pay in to become a member and then we long term preserve these items and we also make them openly accessible. And I guess the important thing to say about that as well is that DRI um, stewards data. It A lot of the data in there is not ours. So we have our own research projects and we publish um, those research uh, projects through the repository, but really we are minding other people's data. So we have 24 different members, and we have six community members at the moment, and I differentiate those because the community members um, do not pay um, to have their uh, data put into DRI. This is a scheme that we run annually for no or low income um, groups to um, apply to have their archive ingested into DRI. I will say the material has to be digitized already. We don't undertake the process of digitization ourselves. We're about minding data that has already been digitized. Um, so to my mind, some of our richest collections have come from the community members. Um, not that I'd like to say I have a favorite collection, but um, just to give you an example of the kind of wide range of community members that we have. Um, our first, uh, our inaugural winner for the Community Archive Scheme was um, the Cork LGBTQ Archive, and they have a really wide range of collections um, where really, I guess, um, they're showing the kind of richness of the LGBT um, community in Cork, but also the history around it and making sure that that's getting preserved. That's also aggregated through Europeana. So I guess it adds one more piece into the larger, really important European history um, of um, the LGBT communities. Um, we also have uh, one of our other community archive winners is um, the Dublin Ghost Signs, which I'll have to say I'm a particular fan of. Um, so this is a collection undertaken by, um, I guess you'd, yeah, she's, I mean, she's a community archivist, archivist. she does this totally unpaid. Um, Emma, who she goes out and she photographs and 
and documents um, street signs that might be fading or um, that might only uh, be something that you could see for a short period of time. So in shops, when they take down the big, horrible plastic signs, you might get a glimpse of a historic street sign. So she'll photograph that, map it and put a huge amount of information into the historic shop that was there. So it's huge value for our commercial um, history, uh, street heritage, um, and then one of our other community members uh, that's worth mentioning is the Elephant Collective. So this is um, a group um, who came together to legislate to make sure that all maternal deaths that occurred in Ireland had a post-mortem, which sounds like a very basic thing, but actually um, it's not. Um, Ireland was the first country to pass its legislation, which I think opens up a lot of questions as well. But I'm not going to get into that today. Um, we take collections from researchers and DRI research projects. Um, so I guess I wanted to say a little bit about DRI for researchers. So we can provide a solution for organisations and researchers to meet their funder requirements for national funding streams or European. And what I mean there is um, it's becoming more and more um, common that when you apply for research funding, they ask you how you're going to preserve this. And they mean beyond a website. So it's not just about putting something up, hosting it for three years, what happens after the life of a project. Um, and DRI helps researchers um, to fulfill their remit of needing to long-term digitally preserve this. Um, and through um, our relationship with the Irish Research Council and the HEA, um, we're always advocating for better ways to re I suppose, support researchers and to make sure that they have the funds to access long-term preservation. Um, we also have a full set of research data management resources on our website um, that talk about and look at the kind of long-term management um, of the data that you're creating. And Annie, um, research collections that are put into DRI are fair. So that means findable, they're accessible, interoperable um, and reusable data, which is very important. So there's just a collection of different things there that people can use um, as a researcher. So data management plans. I also wanted to mention um, DRI and early career researchers. Um, which uh, I think is probably more important for you guys as postgrads. Um, so to my mind, the most important group of researchers that we need to be working with are early career researchers and to try and build from the base up a community of people who are thinking about long term digital preservation. Um, so we have um, an early career research award, um, which is worth 500 euro. Um, and opens this year on the 31st of July and closes on the 30th of September. So I would say, please, please, if you are using DRI for any of your work or you're thinking of using DRI for any of your work, have a look at this. So what the award aims to do is if you're using any of our collections, we ask you to come and tell us about it, how you've used them um, and if you how you've used it in an original way. Um, and uh, it's a way of us promoting how people are using the repository. Um, this year with repository or with archives and libraries shut, one of the things that we have done is put together a webinar, webinar series called Using Digital Archives for Academic Research. And this is a three part webinar series where we asked um, our members to talk about their collections that are in the repository with the idea, I guess, of, of trying to spark people um, into finding a research project and maybe thinking about how they can use um, digital archives more for research. Um, so all of those are recorded. They're on the website. Um, we themed them. Um, I wasn't particularly fond of these themes, I'll have to say, because to my mind, all three of them um, were relevant to people working in the area of HSS. Um, but the first one was on historical sources. The second was on archaeology and geography, and the third was on social science. But I would definitely say all three of them um, had relevance, particularly to somebody working in Irish studies. Um, we've also produced a booklet to go along with that. And this is where we asked 
our members if they could give us a couple of their collections that were in the repository or that they hadn't yet put in the repository, um, but that they feel um, are ripe for researchers to kind of look through and um, find research projects in. So there's 55 different collections there. There's a lot of themes cutting across the collections that have been put in there and um, we assembled it alphabetically with the idea that we didn't want people to kind of um, go looking for one thing and not see the collections as a whole. Um, it's really just a snapshot of what we have, but um, if people are looking for material or research ideas, I think it's a good place to start. Um, so just to tell you how you can find us. So we're on Twitter. Uh, I thought I'd put the Twitter page up here, so apologies. Um, our Facebook page is there. We're probably most active on Twitter. Um, you can sign up to our mailing list. Um, if you have a look at our website and go to dri.ie contact. Um, and on the mailing list and, and in Twitter, we will be advertising the Early Career Research Award. Um, so just to say, um, I think as a humanities person who joined DRI, um, it definitely made me think about what is research data and it made me realise that actually I created a huge number of data sets during my PhD and in subsequent research um, that I didn't see as data sets and that were lost, that could definitely be reused by other people. Um, and we want to make sure that that's not happening and that um, as much of our research is shared and open and out there. Um, so Lucy sent me on a set of questions that um, people had sent in in advance, and I'm happy to just open those up and maybe answer them. Is that the best way to go, Lucy? Yeah, that's yeah, the that's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So um, the first question that got sent in advance are what are some of the challenges of creating access to digital archives? Uh, I don't want to be lazy and say funding, <laughs> but I guess, um, you know, so the challenges of creating access to digital archives, well, you know, sometimes it's been that people don't really think about us or they think that we might not have um, that much content. And so in one way for us um, with COVID and lockdown, people have actually began to think about us more. Now, that's not to say I think digital archives should be used in isolation. I definitely don't, but it's definitely made people um, think about us. Um, but we also need to be thinking about access in a broader term and we're always kind of keen to hear feedback from people about our interface and just generally how you would use us um, and one of the um, pieces of feedback that we have heard quite a bit is that um, DRI actually has a very academic interface and that people find it quite difficult to use. So with that in mind, we've created um, a user group um, to try and um, get feedback more formally about how people use the repository and what difficulties and stumbling blocks that they may have in doing that. Um, but we're also um, trying to open the, our website and the repository up um, to be more user friendly, I guess, across um, um, yeah, just the public and anyone else who might use it. Um, sorry, so one of the other questions, can more be done to improve accessibility of these archives, particularly for people with disabilities, those with low literacy or even those uh, whose first language isn't English? Yes. Absolutely. Um, if we're going to talk about um, making things digital and putting them online, we shouldn't be saying that the benefits of digitization is just that I'm in Australia and I can see something in Ireland. It has to go beyond yeah. that and we have to be able to put up um, more software, more tools in place that allow people with visual impairment um, or, or hearing difficulties to be able to access these, making sure that our websites are readable, uh, but also transcriptions, for instance, will allow a, a lot more accessibility for people. And transcriptions are definitely something that we're trying to build upon. Um, and 
on our work plan for 2021, we are looking at our equality, diversity and inclusion plan. And a big part of that is looking at how we can make the repository more open um, to people who may have um, difficulties in accessing material like this. Um, so I was I was actually really interested in hearing about the audiovisual descriptions um, at the Maze Longkesh, um, and that just really struck me. Um, I think Hannah was the speaker. Apologies if I if I got that wrong, but she spoke about how um, people who um, did not have these difficulties actually found the audiovisual descriptions to be really helpful, um, and I can see that as well. So I guess. Um, it's not to say that we would be doing it for that, but you know the importance and how it can actually help and provide access or uh, improve access to everyone. Um, so one of the other questions I have here is, would archive centres and libraries in the future become obsolete once all resources from books, newspapers to ancient documents have been scanned and made available online? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I'll have to say, um, when I joined DRI first, we have a, a conference series that we run every two years. We actually ran it two years ago in Queens um, through the library. It's the Digital Preservation of Art, Social Science and Humanities. We call it DPASH. And I attended my first DPASH um, conference in, um, in Brighton, actually, which was amazing to go to. But um, one of the speakers, the keynote speakers said, the future is hybrid and this has really kind of struck me and stayed with me the whole way through. Um, digital is important because it will provide greater access and it will um, preserve things in, you know, the awful example of a museum being burnt down or an archive being burnt down. But really the future is hybrid. We will be using a mix of resources. And I just don't, I can't see there being a situation in the future where everything is digitized. But it, it's also important for future archives. So I know that PRONI and the National Archives are now in a position where they are taking in state records and what they're taking in is email. And so we need to think about our future needs. So they need a place not just to display all of these future records, but to long term preserve them. So that's not about buying a new warehouse for PRONI. It's about um, buying a whole um, suite of servers and making sure that long term preservation works. Um, and I'll have to uh, say DRI actually worked with the National Archives on producing a report for how they could um, preserve their digital records in the future. Um, so that's something that I think is important for for uh, thinking about how future archives might look. Um, just to say on that question as well, um, libraries reopened in uh, the Republic on Monday um, and it, it having them shut for so long is a reminder that they're not just people who give us books for free. It's such an community space um, and they provide such an important range of services um, and kind of sociability for a lot of people. So as well as all of the things they do, you know, I think they're important for that. Um, so one of the other questions here is, has digitizing sources and new technologies changed the behavior of academics in how they undertake research, in your opinion? So that's a big, a big question. Um, I'll have to say when I started my PhD, and I would be embarrassed to say how long ago that was, um, when I started my PhD, one of the big resources that was coming online um, was um, ECHO, which is the 18th century collections online and a lot of early printed books, um, JSTOR and systems like that were becoming a lot um, common and they were being used in research and everybody said, oh, this is the death of academics um, being thorough about their research and they're not going to go beyond these computer systems and they won't leave their offices and they're going to lose a lot. It's just not possible to work like that. Um, and I guess if you are the kind of researcher that will only look towards digital, um, then, you know, your research is going to suffer and it's not going to be um, as rich as it should be. Yes, I think it's definitely changed the way we do things, but um, that kind of scenario that was being presented when I started my research of 
we were only going to use digital hasn't been borne out. Um, and I definitely think we look at things holistically. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, I guess COVID, you know, if we're going to look at the benefits um, to how we all work and operate, it really made us test what the virtual world looked like and to both take away the negatives of it and what doesn't work, but also to take away the positives. And, and there are an awful lot of positives. And I know for DRI, for instance, one of the positives for us is that we've really been able to expand our community and to reach more people. But we've also been able to um, invite speakers um, to come and speak to DRI staff and to our, our broader archiving community that we wouldn't have had before. Um, so we one of the speakers um, that I don't think I'll ever forget listening to was um, Zakia Collier, who's um, a black archivist um, in New York, who talks a lot about, um, you know, the importance of bringing um, all communities into the archive space and actively collecting these archives um, and thinking outside, um, you know, the traditional um, pages and papers that we're collecting. Um, so I think I've answered those four questions. I was going to open it up and see, does anyone else have any questions? But also, I just wanted to open up more broadly to see um, what people wanted to add about the day um, or anything, you know, future concerns that you might have or thoughts you'd like to share. You might not have some, or you might want to pop it in the comment box. That's OK, too. Thank you Thank so you much, much, Lisa. Can I ask, I ask uh, maybe a, a, a pretty basic question? question? And you touched, and you touched on it briefly um, um, when, you, when you, shared you shared with us. us. You, mentioned you mentioned that you that had, had uh, been a complete data, data set and not really realised. And I was just I wondering if you could give us any examples or kind of for people that are PhD students or early career researchers and making funding proposals or research proposals, the sort of things that they can include for digitization that would uh, qualify as data sets that they might not realize. Yes, yeah, so my PhD was on late 18th century Dublin merchants and I look specifically at social mobility um, and this idea. So I, ha I looked at a cross section of um, Catholics, Anglicans and Presbyterians during the period when the penal laws were being repealed because there's kind of a general notion that all of the Catholics went to Russia and, and by land for their children. But it was to have a look at what they were doing really um, socially. Um, so one of the things that I created as a data set um, during my PhD, which to be honest, I wonder, could you even take it off the old Excel format I had it on, was um, I actually sat down with Dublin directories and I tracked addresses and religions of people um, in different streets across the city um, or where I knew their religion um, and looked at the kind of clusters of where different religious groups were. So there's a new light Presbyterian congregation that opens up in Dublin on Strand Street in the 1780s that is hugely important to both the economic life of the city and, and is quite a radicalizing force. So being able to do something like that um, that's a really important, looking back on it now, it's a data set that I could have shared in its own right rather than what it maybe, what I actually used it for, which was kind of reference. And then in the appendix of my thesis, it's like a statistical table of, oh, there were eight here and there were nine there. But actually it's a bigger thing in itself. Um, and I guess what we need to be thinking about in the humanities is, you know, we're not going out and we're running clinical trials, but we are creating data sets all the time. And we need to be recognizing that and giving ourselves, you know, selling that properly um, and giving ourselves a lot more credit for that. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Lucy. Brilliant, thank you. Everybody feel free to, um, as Lisa said, jump in if you have any questions to her specifically or kind of any thoughts on uh, themes that we've 
um, picked up uh, in the symposium as a whole. I just want to ask Lisa and anybody else, feel free to jump in. Um, but just from your own experience in um, seeing these digital archives that are deposited or donated, um, who or what do you think is kind of missing at the minute? Is there um, a, a gap in who or what is represented or um, even even certain materials or um, sources? And that question is kind of been to uh, anybody else as well, if you have any thoughts. Um, well, for us, you know, I, I know myself from working with members, the first stage that we would have is to go out and, and talk to a member about their collections. And there are some really exciting collections coming through. And one of our members who um, I'm looking forward to working with is Monaghan County Council, who are aiming to build um, quite a large collection and repository of physical and digital resources to do with the troubles. Um, but we're also, um, we've just signed a partnership agreement with um, Beyond 2022, which is very important. And we're also looking um, at some of the larger digitization projects that um, have, I don't want to name names because we don't have all of those things yet, but we are working with a lot of bigger projects. But what I would say is sometimes what can be a little stumbling block is that when people have created these digitized um, collections, they haven't thought about their metadata um, and they haven't uh, maybe captured their metadata in a consistent way. And that's really important. And when I started in DRI, again, with my historian hat on, I was like, they're all obsessed with metadata, but it is so crucial. So part of what we try and do at DRI is begin at the at the kind of building blocks and your foundation is thinking about what metadata you want to capture and making sure that you do that in a consistent way before you begin to digitize. That's great, thank you. Peter? Yeah, thanks Lisa uh, and thanks Lucy. Um, we started the symposium this morning um, with uh, a discussion of the problem of um, data sets and archives um, being behind paywalls, being you know created and with with business business models uh, involving you know uh, private corporations um, and the problems that this posed um, for researchers in terms of you know having to find subscriptions, etc. And you mentioned yourself, Lisa. Uh, you know what's the biggest problem facing? An institution like the the DRI, its funding is, is the thing you started with. So, can I ask a question about funding, um, and whether you think um, the prospects looking forward for funding being made, either more funding being made available for the creation of digital resources through the various um, funding bodies or through the states, um, or potentially. Um, Technolo technological changes making the process of digitization cheaper, whether either of these things are, 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 are you know, uh, appearing on the horizon, or are we always going to be under this problem of, of people having great ideas about creating digital resources, but really struggling to find the funding to, to realize those, those ideas? Um, that's a great question, Peter. I don't, I, yeah. It's a great question. I, I will say, so while we charge a membership fee, that is just um, for institutions to come and join us and to make sure that we're preserving their data. That is not for researchers. Anything that we have is, is free to access. Um, in one sense, I think um, for long-term preservation, we are seeing some benefits. So one of the things that we do in DRI is we have an infrastructure roadmap and we're constantly um, replacing our servers and servers are getting cheaper. But that's not quite the question you asked. You asked about digitization um, and is the digitization um, process going to speed up and get cheaper? And I'll, I'll have to say I don't think so because um, digitization relies on one person sitting down to digi digitize an object or what I would say is I hope not because that maybe um, means that somebody is going to be paid less to do that. Um, but it also definitely depends on the complexity of the object. So um, at the moment we're speaking to the Registry of Deeds in Dublin um, about um, a digitization project that they're hoping to undertake. And um, it's a hugely important source that is very inaccessible. And it's actually one that I used during my PhD. And it's, it's 
they have these records, they're big volumes called tombstones, and they are literally the size and weight of a tombstone. And so that's going to mean that some one person is going to be hired to go through these huge physical um, objects and to sit down and to digitize that. And, and you know, it's a complex item to digitize. And I guess that the um, cost, a lot of the cost there is going to be with actually the person and then the cost moves on to the storage itself. And again, from our point of view, we've seen servers getting faster and getting a little bit cheaper, which is good. Um, but I guess the third thing that we've had to start thinking about, and it's important for us to talk about as well, is the climate impact of these servers. Um, and so something we've been talking about, we're actually reviewing our infrastructure roadmap at the moment. It sounds very boring to be all sitting in a room counting servers and talking about it, but it's really important as well because I guess it's, you know, it's the storage, it's your it's the equivalent of bricks and mortar for everyone else. But so we have started to think about, well, how do we offset the carbon which is produced by these servers, which is huge. I do think though, like to end on a, a slightly more optimistic note, I think governments are being more um, pragmatic about digitization and digital preservation. And there was a really fantastic round of funding um, in, what month are we in? We're in May, that went around in February and March. It was a really interesting initiative um, where the IRC and the AHRC um, want to uh, create um, all island research projects uh, across the British Isles. And they've specifically st stipulated um, the importance of digital preservation and digitization. So they're beginning to build costs in for this. And it's not clear yet how that's going to look fully. Um, and uh, the European Commission has, you know, put out this mandate for us all to make sure that our research is open. And I think that's very important. You can put out an idea and how does it work on the ground? And what we're trying to do with the National Open Research Forum is figure out, well, how does this work? What are the implications? Um, and I know, again, with my historian hat on, not my DRI hat, like what is the impact of this going to be on academic publishers who have supported researchers for a long time to get their material out there. Um, so there's lots of things to think about, but I am hopeful that they're moving in the right direction and they are actually thinking they're going to put some money into it and they are thinking about it. I hope that answers your question. I think we have a question from Dara. Thanks, Lucy, and uh, thanks so much Lisa, for that really um, fascinating presentation on, on what the DRI is doing and where they're going in the future. Uh, and my question kind of builds on that. And actually, some of your comments and to answer Peter's question kind of suggested my current one. Um, I suppose, in a way, we're starting to think beyond COVID, dare I say those words, um, depending on which country you're in. And actually, that speaks to kind of the international aspect that you addressed earlier, that the inequality potentially in terms of access and visibility um, and so on. I'm just wondering, to what extent do you think COVID has changed the um, potential for digital digitization and um, the DRI and so on? Um, you know, do you see, for example, among policymakers, stakeholders locally, nationally, and internationally, a sustainable long-term conversation to be ha had regarding, let's say, hybridity and so on? Or given that, I suppose, in the South, for example, we're probably looking at the end of the summer before things are opened up you know, as they were to some extent, is there going to be a reversion to kind of traditional physical archiving in that regard? Or do you see a paradigm shift that has evolved, emerged from COVID? Thanks. Um, that's a really good question. Um, maybe I'm, yeah, I'm not sure any kind of coherent <laughs> response has necessarily come out of government policies at the moment. Maybe that's me feeling a bit grim. You know, I, I haven't seen them articulate anything. Um, but I, I guess I have a more positive response in a sense that um, with a lot of archives and museums being shut, they definitely thought about access and about what they are doing with their staff, you know, at home, unable to access their workplace. Um, and how exactly are they going to share what they're doing? Um, and so that I think is really positive. And again, to go back to the first DPASH conference that um, I attended at the University of Sussex, 
they had um, a speaker that I, I think I can't remember the museum she was from, but she was from a Dutch museum and she actually talked about um, it was the Dutch art, gal art gallery and she talked about how they digitized all their collection and they made it free and openly accessible. And they told people you can use the items, you can make versions of the items. We're not putting copyright on it. And um, she actually talked about how um, it led to an increase in numbers through their doors. And so what we have seen is a lot of museums saying, OK, people can't access our collections, um, but we want them to see them. So they've come and they've joined us. And a, an example of that actually is the Unpost Museum has recently joined us and they have the most fabulous collection um, of digitized stamps. Now, they're a really small um, group, but stamp collecting worldwide is so important and so that's going to provide them with a big access and I think that in particular when it comes to um, galleries, libraries um, and museums and the general glam sector, they, they are worried about copyright on their images and this has made them shift their thinking a bit more and they've definitely started thinking, um, maybe the government's not pushing it, but I definitely think that they are thinking about access and how do we do this and heaven forbid if there was another lockdown, how do we ensure that actually we're still bringing our content um, and I think that's really positive and and I also think they're going to see a lot of the benefits of it because you can see something online, but you're going to want to go and visit it. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Dara. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, I think we have a question for yeah. For me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Lucy. So, sorry. First off, I want to say congratulations for organising such a a wonderful uh, conference uh, seminar. I I really enjoyed all of the all of the presentations. It's not a question per se. Well, it is in a sense. Um, I seem to have had difficulty with my internet connection, so I missed the presentations from Rebecca and from Chris Howell. Um, uh, is there a possibility that can be shared, or what's what's the plan for the recordings? Yeah. Um. So both. Um the session before lunch and the session after lunch have been recorded um, and once this call is finished the videos will be uploaded in the chat um, so in the Digitising Ireland channel um, and then hopefully they'll be going on um, a web page I think um, Professor Gray can advise on that but it should be on the Irish Studies web page soon. Excellent thank you very much. Problem. Well a really really good good work a really enjoyable I learned a lot. I'm particularly interested in the GIS presentation um, I have a feeling that might suit me as well. I don't ever. I read uh, an article when I was doing my MA by um, Neil Cunningham, and he did a GIS project on Belfast in the 1920s. And he mapped, he used the GIS to map um, the incidents of violence. It was very, very interesting. He also combined it with the 1901 and 1911 census. So it was really, really instructive. So that, that has me thinking. Well, thanks very much. It's good to see Mr. Gannon, a former a former lecturer of mine from Minute. You, you, you're very, very unfortunate to have him up there. However, thanks very much. Thank you. Yep, Peter um, has just informed us that the recordings will be posted on the Irish Studies page um, when the session is finished. Thanks very much. Can I ask a quick question about um, kind of how you record um, materiality uh, of some digitised sources? Lisa, you touched on it a little bit when you talked about um, maybe 3D images of um, certain places or monuments or objects, um, but uh, you'll know yourself from work on photography. Um, I obviously um, I'm doing my PhD in photographic uh, sources and I've been so grateful for um, uh, just how many of them have been digitised. It's been a real lifeline for me, especially over the past year um, when I, I have been researching and unable to go to the archives. Um, but obviously a lot of the materiality of the object is lost, especially when it's things like um, daguerreotypes or um, 
lantern slides or things that you really need to get a sense of the size or the inscriptions on um, or even how something looks completely different when it's moved in a different angle. So I was just wondering if the DRI um, have any initiatives or you're aware of any uh, initiatives uh, globally where um, photographs are being digitised in a way that isn't just a two-dimensional image? Very specific question, but is what I'm interested in. No, and you've actually reminded me that I should have talked a little bit about our IIIF viewer. Um, so one of the um, capabilities that we have is um, a viewer um, that we installed probably about five years ago called IIIF. And the idea behind this is that you can really zoom in to actually see um, a photograph or a manuscript. But also if... Um, if you have an item on another repository that has IIIF that you would like to view side by side, you can actually pull that in. So UCD has a IIIF um, viewer and they also have some collections that you could um, compare and contrast with ours. So it might be a map or it might be um, two copies of the same book, but one maybe has notes in the margin. So you can pull them in, you can put them side by side, zoom in and out, and, and it allows you to appreciate, I guess, sometimes items being the same, but different for different reasons. But you can also look and compare streetscape um, and images, um, which I think is very important. I have to say at the moment, we only have one item in our 3D collections, and this is something that we're really working on building up because I think um, 3D collections are, are really important. I know there are institutions um, out there in Ireland who have some very significant 3D objects, and we have been talking to one or two of them, but we need to work with them to get them in because um, that's going to provide you know, a whole new type of archive to be able to say that you can look at it. It's like you say, it's moving it around. And and one of the archives that we were talking to recently has, has digitized things in such an interesting way. And actually they were talking about clasps on a book and getting a 3D image of a clasp on a book, which I just think is fabulous. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Sorry, my computer froze. Um, I think we have a question from Christopher. Hi. Um, yeah, for the really interesting chat and, and, and thank you, Lucy, for um, organising today. It's been really, really enlightening and fascinating. Uh, I just uh, that made me think of something kind of related to my own stuff, but um, uh, I just wanted to follow up on, on the chat we were just having about 3D objects was um, the work uh, I'm thinking particularly of the Beyond 2022 project and then the recreation, uh, the archive building as a way of navigating the source so rather than having a search function and, you know, typing in because you need to know, it's almost like it's known unknowns and all that sort of thing. You need to know what you're searching for in order to be able to find it. There's, so I thought that was a really interesting approach that there. I don't know how prominent it's actually going to be in the final representation of it, whether it's still actually going to be based on a, a, like a, a web archive and that'll be a secondary part, or is there still the intention to go through the 3D model and access it as you would have done back before the fire in the original archive building? I hope that's making sense for anybody who isn't, isn't familiar with the project. Um, but I was just wondering, is that not just digital digitising objects to be stored within a, a digital archive, but actually can, reconsidering how sort of 3D digital can create new user interfaces for the actual accessing of the data? Is that something that uh, you see much scope for or do you see it more as a, a one-off flash in the pan for that particular instance with that particular project? Um, actually, I'll have to say, so the deputy director of Beyond 2022, who was at the event I was at earlier, um, is a good friend of mine, Kieran, and I, I sent him on your website um, because it's so fantastic and there are a lot of um, crossovers in the methodology and I was really interested um, in actually how you did that and even just to I loved that you pulled out um, that quote and you managed to find the little square window also I went by that I used to walk by that building all the time so um, I really enjoyed your talk um, thank you it's you know actually and I've also been on a beyond 2022 to, to try and make sure that at the least we're preserving that amazing 3D image I think the idea that they have is that you can go in through um, the treasury but that you will also be able to use kind of a more search function um, but I couldn't say that for sure and they they might contradict me in that um, I 
don't see DRI changing to um, a function ourselves where we're representing something in that way because we just at the moment don't have the functionality so we have three software engineers at the moment and they do an awful lot <laughs> they're amazing uh, but i think it's a really important and evocative um, way of representing the images and i are sorry representing the whole experience of the archive and i guess it's an important to say that what you're doing is both um you're both recording the history and you're capturing that history, but you're also creating something new out of it. And um, so there's two things being created. And I guess in DRI, we would say that we preserve both, which is the original item. And then, you know, the secondary item that's created. They're both so important sitting together, but it's important to give weight to each of them as individual items. And I think it's hugely important and it might be controversial to say, um, but it shows the creativity of historians and the humanities as well to show that you know there's a huge amount of creativity coming out of the past in the way that we think about that and we represent it and i know particularly as a historian not everyone would like me saying that we're creative um and imaginative but yeah it's it, it was i think it's hugely important and i actually see it as more of a growing trend um, and it's adding layers to that historical narrative. I'm not sure I've answered your question, Christopher, but it's a really fantastic project and I look forward to it, looking at the website more. Thanks. Um, no, I'm not sure it was a particularly coherent um, question to oh. begin with. So I think, I think that you did really address um, the, what I was thrusting at. So um, thank you for your sort of telepathy and, and filling in the gaps of what I was <laughs> thrusting at. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that the sort of thing that really interests me is that is the connection to other information that you might not know to look for uh, and, and you sort of that, that's one way of doing it by recreating a physical archive building in virtual space and you can explore shelves digital shelves and find digital art but i think there are other ways of doing it and i, I think the problem is again back to what you were saying it's it's the it's the um the parsing of that data and the cataloging and and the linking to other sources that's massively time unless unless ai can step into that breach in future and might make it cost effective but in, in, I think at the moment it's just so expensive to do that if you every source and link it to every other source that could possibly it, it, it grows exponentially in terms of time and cost. I guess though it's one of the importance of transcription so when you use DRI you can use a search function to um, search through the metadata and to search through the um, sources themselves if they've been transcribed so you're actually getting kind of layers of um, material brought back to you and one of the things I get really excited about when we go out and talk to members is um, when there's an overlap of collections so either geographically or um, thematically or through space and time like one of the things that we've started to do actually is to um, map um, collections so um, if you have the geolocation data um, you know you can actually look at a map of Ireland and hone in on it um, and it will tell you all the different collections for that um, regionality and that's just going to build up and build up over time so, and it's quite exciting to see that but again I think one of the difficulties there can be is um, you're only as good as what you put in and it comes back to the metadata. So if people have poor metadata, you're not going to be able to find the collections um, as quickly. And sometimes, you know, it's not possible for digitized collections to have good metadata because they've been created in such bulk. And it goes, I suppose this comes back to one of the earlier questions, which is, um, you know, is it going to become cheaper and, and easier? But when um, photographs, for instance, large volumes of photographs have been digitized, um, we have one of these problems with them. Um, the Fulcher Ireland collection um, for Dublin City Library and Archives, um, which is uh, photographs from throughout the 20th century that Fulcher Ireland took to entice people to Ireland. And they're a wonderful resource, but they were digitized in bulk for time and speed. And so photographs say Dublin or Kilkenny. And actually they're a very specific place. Um, and so we're missing a lot from that, um, which can be frustrating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if we have no more questions, 
um, before we close, I would just like to uh, thank everybody um, who has taken part. Thank you to um, all the participants. Thank you to um, all of uh, my panel chairs, Dara, Deidre and Donal. Um, also, thank you to the Institute of Irish Studies for making this possible, um, for Peter um, and also for Cathy, who has been just amazing at circulating all the information. Um, and thank you to Lisa. I took a bit of a mind blank earlier on. Uh, Lisa uh, had her undergrad and master's at UCD and her PhD at Trinity. Um, and there has been lots of universities represented today, obviously Queen's. Um, we have Trinity and Ulster, and I know that there are people on the call from other institutions and universities, so I hope you find it really helpful. If you're like me and have an interest in old photographs or um, architecturally, it might be interesting as well. I forgot to mention that uh, Lisa also has a book, uh, Dublin Then and Now, which has some beautiful images of Dublin in the past and present. Um, but yeah, I would just like to finish by giving uh, Lisa, our chairs and our panellists a big round um, of virtual applause. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a delight just to hear um, from all of you today uh, and thank you for your encouragement. Um, and these will be recorded, they'll be put in the chat and also they will be available um, on the website um, that is linked below. Thank you.